Great to see everybody here, particularly at UCSD, where I'm not even sure this is a real course. So fantastic. Uh, my name's Ed Lazowska. You'll meet the other co-instructors in a bit, uh, Steve Maurer at uh, Berkeley and uh, Jeff Volker at San Diego. Uh, this is History of Computing, and I'm just going to do a quick introduction, and then Steve's going to do the uh, lecture for tonight. Uh, this is a, a good time to take this course, and something I'll come back to in a minute is you can make this as technical as you want. All right? So. Um, it's, it's sort of your call when we get to course projects and stuff, exactly how technical you want to be. We do want to extract sort of lessons and policy implications from the work that we do in the class. But, uh, you know, if you want to study particular architectural trends and stuff like that, that's completely acceptable. Uh, as uh, Steve has mentioned in some email, it's a great time to take this class because there are a large number of history of computing books that have been written in the past five or seven years. So there's a wealth of material out there. There's tons of really interesting stuff. And uh, we'll expose you to, uh, to uh, uh, lots of it as we go along. Let me talk a bit about the guests we'll have in the class first. Uh, again, Steve will do a set of lectures. I'll do a set of lectures. But uh, I, I think th the way to think about the division of labor in this course is, first of all, at San Diego, poor Jeff Volker is the uh, person uh, who picked this up on an overload basis to make it available to students down there because there was no one else willing to step up. So Jeff is a uh, UW PhD student who uh, developed from us the terrible habit of standing in place when everybody else takes two steps backwards. So Jeff, thanks for uh, doing that job down there. Uh, Steve has, uh, and Jeff and I have co-taught courses three years now uh, in this program. We did IT and public policy two years ago. We did uh, cybersecurity and homeland security last year, history of computing now. Steve is actually the scholar of the bunch. So he's done prodigious reading, uh, which you would normally expect one to do in preparing a course over uh, the last spring and summer. Uh, I have a lot of friends who I sent email to and said, would you please speak in this course? And most of them are even older than me, so they contributed to the history. So uh, here's who these folks are, and they'll be sort of spread out through the quarter, and we'll have some others uh, introduced later on. Uh, Gordon Bell will talk to us about uh, mini computers. Gordon was the vice president for engineering at DEC for many years. Uh, he, uh, so during sort of their glory years, when they did the PDPs and the VACs, uh, he was a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, independent consultant for years. Now, like a lot of these folks who are going to talk to us, he's gravitated towards Microsoft, but he was at DEC when they were doing mini computers, which is an important part of the history. Uh, Butler Lampson is probably the greatest computer system software designer and uh, was the leader of the teams at uh, Xerox Park Computer Systems Lab when they did Ethernet and Alto, bitmap displays, the uh, uh, Dover laser printer and things like that. So Butler will talk to us about uh, Xerox Park hardware and software during the Alto and Ethernet days. Um, and again, the challenge for us is to engage these folks and really learn from them. Uh, Steve Wozniak uh, was the Apple I and Apple II guy. Uh, he's actually, he'll be in Seattle uh, on October 6th when this gets started, uh, on a book tour. Minutes. And uh, uh, then he'll speak to us from Berkeley uh, in uh, in November in the course. And uh, again, Woz isn't recent Apple, he's original Apple. So Steve Jobs uh, is has been sort of the visible face of Apple for years, but Woz is the guy who designed and built the machines. So uh, in terms of actually the engineering of those systems and the early machines, and uh, Woz's book, which is ab about to be released, I saw a pre-publication copy, makes it clear that the Apple II was generating all of the revenue for Apple for an enormous period of time. I mean, that's what made the company uh, prior to the Mac taking off and then music players. Uh, Burton Smith. Uh, will talk to us about the history of high performance computing. Burton is uh, probably the <coughs> most creative computer architect around these days. He, uh, for years, ran a company called Denelcor, which stood for the Denver Electric Company. Uh, and Denelcor designed a really advanced multi threaded high performance machine called the, the HEP, the Denelcor HEP, which uh, never got implemented in fast enough technology that it was successful, but uh, uh, it was a very creative design, and he then went back to design computers for federal agencies for a number of years, and then got funded to start a company in Seattle called Terra Computer Corporation. So moved to Seattle probably a dozen years ago to do Terra. Uh, as Terra went up and Cray was going down, Terra actually acquired Cray. So Burton was the chief scientist of Cray for a number of years. He's 
not just an architect, but he really understands these sort of scientific algorithms and how you map them onto architecture. So he'll talk about that. Uh, Ray Ozzy, who's just recently become the uh, chief software architect at Microsoft, is going to talk to us about uh, the history of collaboration software. So Ray's history, again, he's been at Microsoft for only a year and a half. Uh, he began working on the Plato system at the University of Illinois as a student in the 1970s. He was a systems programmer on Plato. Plato was a mainframe system, but it was the first big collaboration system. So it had the equivalent of wikis and instant messaging and team collaboration tools and things like that. That has really been Ray's entire career. So he went to Lotus. Uh, uh, he did Lotus Notes, uh, went off and did startups of his own, which Lotus then acquired, and then left again in his most recent startup, Groove Networks, which was a, a sort of secure, uh, multi-site, multi-organization collaboration tool was acquired by Microsoft. And he became a uh, CTO of Microsoft a year ago and is now the chief software architect. So again, this is somebody who really has defined collaboration software over a 30-year career. Um, we've got... Uh, John Markoff coming from the New York Times. Uh, that will be sort of a, a, a treat that's uh, a, a little off to the side a bit. Uh, John is uh, one of the two uh, really strong IT correspondents for the New York Times. The other is Steve Lohr. Uh, and so they write about computing stuff. You see it in the Times all the time. Uh, about a year ago, two years ago, maybe, John uh, wrote a book called What the Dormouse Said. I believe that's the title. And essentially, it was about the influence of the Bay Area drug culture on uh, uh, innovations in technology in the 1960s and 1970s. And he's a tremendously engaging guy. And he's someone who you can drive in arbitrary directions because he's been reporting on the West Coast tech industry for 15 years now, unbelievably sharp, knows the Bay Area terribly well, knows Seattle terribly well, uh, just very, very uh, sort of well-read and well-researched and well-connected. Um, we'll have a few others, but I think the opportunity to hear the history from the folks who actually did it is, uh, is a treat, and it should be really special this quarter. So I hope it works out. Uh, one more thing we've got is uh, I have a, uh, an ex-Microsoft friend, Mike Koss, who uh, has taken to buying antique computer equipment on eBay. And uh, one of the things he bought was uh, a set of German Enigma machines. So these are the, uh, the mechanical crypto machines that uh, the Germans used in World War II. And uh, Mike will bring one of those in here. So those of you in the classroom here will be able to uh, play with this thing. But he's ba basically become a student of uh, World War II cryptography, Enigma, Colossus, things like that. Um, one of the things Mike will surely tell you is this, this is the, the big triumph of early computing. There, there's a, a, a phrase called Turing's other machine. You all know of Alan Turing and sort of the mathematics of computing in the Turing machine. But Turing worked at uh, Bletchley Park in England on this machine called Colossus, which cracked the German ciphers in World War II. And it was only 30 years later that it became widely known that, uh, that Turing had worked on real computers in addition to mathematical abstractions for which he's really uh, so well known. Um, so for the last couple of years of World War II, the British and the Americans were in fact reading the uh, German ciphers that were encrypted with these Enigma rotor cipher machines. And it was uh, a challenge for the US military to respond to what Germany was going to do without responding in such a precise way that the Germans would know we had broken their code. All right, so it was uh, an interesting piece of sort of subterfuge. Then after the war, the US sold reconditioned Enigma machines to all kinds of third world nations so that they could have secure communications. So for the next 20 years, uh, we and the Brits were reading their encrypted transmissions. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that's why there are so many reconditioned Enigma machines on eBay. It's that the US government uh, took them from the Germans, reconditioned them, and shipped them out to other countries so they could have secure communications. Um, <laughs> That's, you know, uh, things haven't changed as much as we'd like to think, have they? Um, so anyway, uh, late in the course, Mike will bring an Enigma machine in and talk to us about that. That'll be a bit out of sequence. Because of these guests, things will occasionally come out of sequence, and we'll just have to, uh, uh, have to piece it together. The, the other, uh, th Mike has lots of great pieces of eBay computing equipment. The most ridiculous thing he bought was an IBM 029 card punch. Uh, probably none of you were old enough to have punch in a card punch. Mike, in fact, is not old enough to have used a card punch. Why he spent a thousand bucks for this thing, I don't know. It weighs 600 pounds. It came on this gigantic pallet. It was blocking his garage door. And uh, he, he called me to come over and help him move this thing. And then uh, uh, the, the stunning thing was that 30 years after I had last used a key punch, I was able to remember the drum card codes for duplicating and skipping. It's amazing how much junk is piled up there. 
So, so anyway, this should be uh, a lot of fun. You'll learn half the material from the people who actually created the history and half the material from others. Um, let me mention a couple of uh, glitches we'll have to deal with. Uh, one is we've managed to run Amazon.com out of the text. All right. So uh, one thing I observed just this evening is that the UW, UW library has electronic copies online. So if at the and other other universities may be in the same situation. So if you go to the UW libraries link on the UW homepage and uh, enter the title of the book, uh, you will be if you're at a UW IP address, you'll be led to a couple of electronic copies, and you just click and you've got it. I tried it. So. On the one hand, it's not fun to read a book on PDF, but it's better than not having it at all. Um, the truth is, we asked you to read it before the start of the course, but uh, there are a few chapters relevant tonight. There are a few more chapters relevant next week. If you know, if you paste this and don't go blind, you'll be able to do this with PDF. So ideally, Berkeley and UCSD are in the same situation, um, and uh, you folks can find a computer with a UWIP address or connect from here or something, and you should be all set. Um, so. That's the text. Um, we've put a, uh, th there are going to be two, roughly two assignments in this course. There will be a term project which is yet to be fully defined. We'll get that defined in the next week or so, but roughly we're going to want you to form teams and what we'd really like you to do is a historical study of some aspect of computing, whether we cover it in this course or not. And, and we'll define that, but we'll have a way for you to form up teams and just become an expert on something and in an ideal world what you would do is create a Wikipedia article on that form of computing. There's a lot of good stuff on Wikipedia but there's a lot of stuff missing. So we would love you to actually create history as part of this course uh, and do great Wikipedia pages on stuff that's not there or provide authoritative stuff where there's cruft. But there is a lot of good stuff there as well and on the syllabus we pointed you to a set of resources including Wikipedia and and others. Lots of it isn't too well organized, but uh, there's a chance to do that. So we'll define this later on. And again, part of what we want you to do as you do these projects, and Steve will hopefully talk more about this in a minute, is extract lessons. So in an example, if you want to be really technical about this, you could choose to look at uh, the architecture of the IBM System 360, which as we'll talk about next time or later, was the first time there actually was a computer architecture. There's a page on the syllabus that uh, points you to a list of more than 50 different computers that existed in 1955, and every one of them was different. And IBM as a computer company had all kinds of different computers, the 609, the 709, the 7090. Every one of them was completely different architecturally, so there was no notion that you could move to a more capable system and move your code. Different operating system, different system calls, different arithmetic capabilities. You know, the 360 was really, as a piece of hardware, an architectural triumph because it was a family of computers that spanned a couple of orders of magnitude of performance capability with exactly the same architecture. So even object code could move from machine to machine. You could choose to talk about microprocessors, you know, and, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, evolution of the utilization of transistors as we've had more and more of them. So it's entirely up to you what you do for this project. There are just tons of things to pick from and we'll get you started on that before long. The other thing we'd like you to do, and this is posted on the course web now, there's an assignment called You Be the Expert. And what this means is we'd like you to pick some module of the course or some subset of a module of the course, uh, do reading beyond what's on the syllabus, and drive the discussion. So drive the discussion means be prepared to ask the speaker questions, uh, be prepared to lead the wiki discussion. Uh, the way we're going to have most of our discussion in this course, because the electronic stuff is a little bit crufty, is we'll have a wiki page for each evening. And uh, this has worked out very well the two times we've done this course before. Uh, surprisingly, the computer people seem more averse to the wiki than the non-computer people. Maybe many of the students at Berkeley are, are policy students rather than the ECS students. But it's actually a lot of fun. You know, you, you have to get in there fairly often because people add material. But we'll have a different page for each lecture and it's a chance for you to contribute. And the contribution evaluation at the end of the quarter, and there will be, you know, we do want you to contribute, but a lot of that is going to be the extent to which you stimulated interesting threads or created interesting threads on the wiki. So this doesn't mean that the goal is to type in uh, a bunch of stuff that doesn't lead anywhere. All right, so it's, it's not a character count. It's uh, whether you sort of lead things in insightful directions. And um, the fact that we have 
sort of designated experts for East Module, of course, doesn't mean other people are exonerated from doing the reading. We want everybody to do the reading and participate, but we'd like you to pick something that you're going to become the expert in, whether it's a whole evening or a sub part of the evening. Just find something, go into depth. There's a description of what else we'd like you to do uh, on that part of the website. And again, we'd like to extract implications. It's not just what happened, but why it happened, and are there conclusions or implications that we can draw. Um, there will be a class the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We understand that there's a set of people who will be headed out of town for vacation, but given that there are only 10 or 11 classes, we don't want to cancel that one. Um, so if you're in town, please make an effort to come. Historically, it's been a little thin that night, obviously, but uh, we hope you'll be around. Um, finally, Steve asked me to announce that the, uh, the course will run on clock time rather than Berkeley time. For, uh, that's really for you folks at Berkeley. Berkeley time is some number of days or months late, but uh, particularly <laughs> since we'll have guest speakers in three campuses, we'd actually like to start at uh, as close to 6.30 as we can each night. That's the story. Steve? Sounds good. We'll stop on Berkeley time, too, so you get paid back. <laughs> Great. Well, tonight in the next two lectures, what I'd like to do is bring you up from the dawn of time 12 billion years ago to 1970 or so. And the conceit will be that an awful lot of the DNA of this subject, the, the things that happen in the new economy, so-called new economy even today, have very clear precursors in the past. And of course, for a policy school, there's no point in talking about history unless you think you can learn something. So tonight and the next time, we're going to uh, talk about things that happened historically. That's interesting for its own sake. And beyond that, um, I will try to be the first guy to, to put my toe in the water and try and draw lessons from the past and see what we can extract and how we use evidence to think about things. So that's the exercise. Um, all fields, particularly academic fields, uh, get around to telling stories about themselves, right? And so if you hear sort of what everybody knows about the history of uh, the big computing companies or the history of computer science, it tends to eventually not have a lot of detail. It's just that this guy was walking along one day and he was a great man. And the way you could tell he was a great man is he had this brilliant idea and the world recognized it was a brilliant idea and everything was fine. Um, that's not very informative because the world that you live in has a lot of idiots who won't recognize your brilliant idea. And it pays to sort of look at the evidence in detail about how this was actually a struggle, because struggles are interesting. That's where we live. And we're going to try and get beyond this sort of uh, classic comics view of the world to bring up enough of the evidence about how things really were that we can begin to develop intuition about what it's like in these markets and, and draw lessons that, as they say, will be policy lessons. And in particular, we're going to try and focus on what worked, what didn't, and why. Now, a lot of you are people with business interests, and you might discover uh, in this course some clever insight into how to corner the market. That will be an accident. I don't begrudge it to you if you can do that. Uh, but we will take a policy fr framework, which is that uh, what's good for IBM may or may not be good for what's good for the broader society. But we will take the, the economic view of uh, you know, how should we, as a society, set policy so that human happiness in some sense is maximized. So we'll take a policy view of things, but I will say if you want to sort of learn things that will be useful in thinking about your, your company and making your products work, that hopefully the same dynamics and lessons will be illuminating for you. All right. Um, we have had courses, Ed and I, where we talk very, in very great detail about the economics of this subject. You're welcome to go back on the internet and look at those that might be helpful. Uh, but all the economics that you're really going to need for this course, I'm going to tell you in a very simple way. And that is that any society, uh, any economic system, um, should achieve what a rational commissar, a rational and benevolent commissar would command, right? If there were an all-knowing person running the economy for everybody's benefit, this person would try and tell everybody what to do. And if he was as saintly as commissars aren't, uh, he would, he would uh, you know, give out all the correct orders and we'd do just as well as we can physically possible in terms of all of us being rich and happy. And the way you say that more exactly is he would look at all the things you could invest in as a society, say a new computer idea, and he would say, well, if this thing were built, there would be some value to the society. 
And it's also going to cost us to make this thing, to do the R&D and then to build copies of this computer. And that's a cost, so the cost, call it C, you have some sum, V, the value of the invention, minus C, what the invention costs, and you'd like that to be bigger than zero, right? You don't want to be inventing a lot of sort of useless objects that are very expensive. They're really cool maybe to the inventor, but nobody wants it. Um, you want to have a society that con consistently gets this equation right, that all the opportunities where I can get more V than C are done, and all the others aren't. And everything you've ever heard about incentives, patents, prizes, grants, whatever, are attempts to put up a set of rules that people will automatically sort themselves out so that they'll do the V minus C projects when they're positive, and they won't do them otherwise. And so that's sort of the Cliff's Notes version of what, um, you know, obviously economists have done in much more sublime detail. Uh, but that's the kind of image that I'm going to be using for the next two lectures. And it's frankly a very good way to think about uh, policy in general. Um, there are obviously more, you know, more intellectual ways to talk about this. But basically, if you think about it at this level, you can get a lot of traction on this idea of what's right for the society. And I want to do a little commercial here before we go on to say in the economics jargon there is no dominant incentive mechanism. We live at a time where people believe that patents are the solution to everything except for some people who believe that open source is the solution to everything. Uh, you can actually tell who those respective groups voted for in the last presidential election which should frighten you, right? Um, the truth is if you look at this in a blackboard way all incentive mechanisms are imperfect. This is not the Reagan story about free markets where markets turn out to be the solution for everything. All known incentive systems are imperfect. All of them have areas of strengths and weakness. And so as policy people, we don't want to just sort of say the way they used to in the army, if it doesn't move, paint it, let's patent everything. We want to think about for the various innovation tasks that we're faced with, uh, what should we be using for an incentive in this situation? And I'll try and spell that out more concretely as we go through the history lectures. But the point for now is it's not true. It's a myth that there is one incentive system that is best. I have lived in a, in a legal, I'm a lawyer, and I lived in a legal system circa 1980 where patents were pretty much despised. And I now live in a world where patents are vastly admired, and I'm here to tell you that, you know, in another 50 years, there'll be some other rule. These things come and go like fashions, and more importantly, we know in a careful way that all of these incentive systems are well-matched to some problems and not others, and we can't just close our eyes and adopt them. So that's a long commercial that I'm agnostic about incentive mechanisms. I try not to hold a brief for or against patents. Patents are a great thing in a lot of situations. But you can't sort of go into this course saying, well, of course, we're going to patent everything. You want to think more deeply than that. Okay, so that's it for the machinery. But if you take this V minus C model, I'm now going to tell you on one slide sort of the next two lectures. Um, what happens is as you look through history, uh, well, V changes and C changes. Well, how does V, the value you get from inventions, change? First of all, the technology improves. We get better ideas to do cool stuff, so now we can do more elaborate things. Obviously, nobody was going to make a computer in 1638. Um, so that's one thing. But more importantly, society uses more data than it used to. The hallmark of modernity, and in fact the hallmark of progress in the ancient world, was the societies evolved to use more and more data. And so now if you have more data floating around the society, suddenly the ability to crunch data becomes more useful. So that's one of the themes here. As we become more complicated societies, marginal technologies like calculators suddenly become much more useful and they get built in large numbers maybe because of technical advances, but maybe just as well because the societies have become enormously more complicated and they can get value from manipulating data. And the other point which is very important and people tend to miss is that inventors discover uses for machines, right? So one of the themes that you're going to see in this course, and I'll try and remember to bring this out for you, but practically every one of these heroes who invents a new technology for computing loosely defined in the last two, three, four hundred years was also a consumer of the problem. These are people who were miserable because they had their nose up against some problem like calculating taxes for 12 hours a day 
um, calcu doing banking. The general world of engineers who built calculators and such didn't know about these problems. It was precisely because in one person's head there was both technical knowledge, engineering knowledge, and also the knowledge of this problem, the intimate knowledge of the user need that a lot of this story goes forward. That the invention is not just inventing the arrangement of gears and wheels to do something, it's realizing that the society needs something which involves detailed knowledge of the user. And as we get later in the story, we will start to see how companies like IBM begin to institutionalize the search for finding user needs. And we should, right, what we get taught in the sciences or in engineering tends to be you know, technical solutions are the glory jobs. It's somehow mundane to just worry about customer needs and customer satisfactions. But from the value point of view of the society, something that's technically elegant but, no, but doesn't serve any particular use or doesn't worry about being user friendly to customers isn't that valuable, right? These are two equal activities and we should try and it's inevitable in a course like this that, you know, the technical heroism is going to be a cut above. We all respond to it that way. But the mundane act of finding out what users need, either as individuals or building organizations that are good at doing that, will be a theme of this, these two lectures, and I think a theme of the course in general. Finding out how these technologies can be made to serve needs that we didn't realize we had before. Okay, so that's the value side of it. There's another side of it, and that is that there's the history of the cost side. Um, as you, if you're able to sell lots and lots of copies of your device, you can spread your R&D costs out. If I can only make a calculator that I sell to five people, that's probably not worth it to me. If I can sell it to 100,000, that's different. Uh, as we go through the subject, really expensive objects like gears get replaced by vacuum tubes. That's a small cost saving. And eventually, by integrated circuits and software, you can copy an integrated circuit very cheaply. In a software, you can copy for nothing. And so you end up in a place where you get very fast falling C. And the point is that throughout the history lesson then, V will be going up and C will be going down and all sorts of machines will become possible economically that maybe you didn't want to build 20 or 30 or 50 years ago. That's the 50,000, 70,000 foot view of the subject. And we will end these two lectures about 1970 before, frankly, integrated circuits are even in computers, right? And so we'll end in a world where building the second computer was still horrendously expensive. But I will say that, you know, most of the history of what follows that is that, gee, I built this chip and it's very expensive to make the first one. The second one is quite cheap. Do you see the personal computer in that? I do, right? Before that, computers, quite logically, were these giant devices that you had to assemble by hand. And making a second one of those was almost as expensive as making the first computer. One of the, you know, in the long sweep of this subject, the ability to use lithographic techniques, the same techniques that you use to make books, to lay out these incredibly complicated circuit diagrams is huge in the economics of the subject because it drives the cost of the computer, the second copy of the chip, down to nothing. Um, so that's the long sweep of this, but obviously I need to persuade you that some of this is true, so now we'll go into it in more detail. And that's tonight's lecture. And I want to start talking about the ancient world. Um, you know, you might say, well, that's a little silly. Why talk about the ancient world? Um, you know, probably even today it would be pretty challenging to make a computer that runs on Roman numerals. That was just a hopeless problem for them, right? But it does have sort of this dawning realization of a society going from uh, basically what I could see with my eyes, armies that a guy could command from the back of a horse, little um, uh, governments that were basically the size of a village. You don't need data for that. You just tell people what to do to some bigger scale of social organization. Um, and that crashes in, in sometime in the sixth century uh, and only reemerges in Europe. And as soon as it reemerges in Europe, the conventional date for modernity in Europe is 1648. People are frantically making calculators. This, this ability to have societies that are built around data, around information about stuff that you can't actually see from horseback that's miles and hundreds of miles away. The ability to organize in that way brings with it 
this vast need for an ability to control the data and, and ultimately machines to do that. So the long sweep of the subject, the DNA, the beginning of this, is that, you know, it's not inevitable that societies be organized in this incredibly complicated way, but once they do, this kind of machinery becomes much, much more useful. And I just want to start here because it's not obvious to most human beings and most of the world most of the time that, you know, we live in this society where data is all that important, right? And so there's this wonderful Henry David Thoreau where he says, an honest man has hardly need to count more than his ten fingers or in extreme cases his toes and lump the rest. I say let our affairs be as two and three and not as a hundred or a thousand. Instead of a million, count half a dozen and keep your accounts on your thumbnail. This is very American, right? This is, on the one hand, a person who's just letting go of a society where that was approximately true. And on the other hand, of course, it has this American nostalgia for things rural, for a world that none of us actually ever knew that was more virtuous because it was simple and, and, you know, wasn't it great when we didn't have to count past our fingers and toes. So I think it's a wonderful, elegant line, but the point is it underscores this intuition that it's not obvious that societies have to be organized in this really complex way, but that drives a lot of the story tonight. Um, so, talk a little bit about very old history, and this is, all of this is about the V because there were no machines to build, C was infinite. Uh, can't make machines that do Roman numerals very easily. Um, but where data emerges is where you have opportunities to do things that are sensible investments that have a scale that is beyond the horizon. And so you end up not coincidentally having this plethora of records, records about every conceivable transaction, moving goods back and forth, sales, marriages, deeds, all the stuff of modern life emerges when you get these, these uh, polities that are built around irrigation systems where the minimum scale of the irrigation system is very large. You can't make a small irrigation system. You have to have lots of people involved over a large geographic area and this stuff emerges. And the first records are about 3000 BC. Uh, the best example actually is from Sumer about 2400 BC. Um, some barbarians decided that they were going to burn down the government records hall. Government records hall was made of clay, so you fire baked all these tablets and they're still sitting around for people to decipher. It's kind of a cosmic irony. Um, Egypt gets uh, working at about the same time and for about the same reasons to extend uh, <coughs> government across the whole area of Egypt. And the Romans. Um, about 10 or 20 percent of the Roman Empire was actually directly owned by the emperor and so you have this enormous machinery rather like a multinational corporation for moving volumes of goods back and forth across the length and breadth of the empire in the Mediterranean. So you have a very sophisticated operation today. I think you'd call it commerce, but I guess it was technically part of the empire and governance. So you start having as the first big use, and remember this story will all be about finding uses for these machines, um, you start having as the first big use the need to govern across areas bigger than you can physically dominate. The military, of course, follows government. The Egyptians figure out about 1500 BC that organized soldiers will beat a mob every time. To have that, you need pay books. Eventually, you need all sorts of formal orders and stuff. Um, Philip II invents something like the modern army staff college, staff system. Um, he gets 10 or 15 guys, it's not a lot, to do planning for his armies so that when they come to a uh, river, there will be a bridge built for them so that there will be food delivered at various places so the fleet will show up at certain times. You now have people full-time manipulating information beyond the horizon. It's not a big thing, but it's an industry. And this is, is something that didn't occur before. And if you think about Alexander the Great, right, every crackpot in Western history wants to dominate Europe and Asia. The only guy who came close was the guy whose father invented this staff system where suddenly armies could efficiently go beyond sort of neighborhood fights and go well beyond the horizon and accomplish things at a distance. Um, and not coincidentally, Alexander leaves his empire, including Egypt, to the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies see the power of having government run data, having armies that are well 
um, organized. And what do they do? They found the Library of Alexandria so they can teach people to read and to write and to keep records. And this great library of the ancient world, anyone who wants to read more of this, there's a lovely book by Lionel Casson, very scholarly on this, called The Ancient Libraries. came out maybe five years ago. Um, this is, you know, in the great sweep of things, an incredible human invention that you begin to develop societies that aren't just a collection of villages, but exist in some sense as a coherent entity across time and space. And to do that, you need lots and lots of data. Um, Aristotle, I love ac all things academic, of course. So Aristotle corners the market on knowledge. He's the first guy to own a large private library, huge library, 400 books. It's so huge that when he dies, there's a, a treasure hunt in the, for three generations afterwards trying to find the lost books of Aristotle. People are frantically looking for this unique resource. But again, this is the idea that, you know, until the latter part of the 19th century, the expensive parts of the university were not the sciences, they were the humanities, because you had to have this library to do the humanities. Um, it's a research tool. If you had all these books, you could do research. If you didn't, you couldn't. That's another reason you have the Library of Alexandria, obviously. They thought they had every papyrus in the entire world. They were probably pretty close. And then something really interesting happens. This is the main reason to tell this little opening act. But in the, in the sixth century, something happens apparently all over the world. But in any case, it's well recorded in the Byzantine Empire. And they have this wonderful poignant moment where a scribe writes that the body, there were so many people dying, there wasn't enough people to count them. And this is a society collapsing inward on itself and the ability, this advanced ability to have a society of data and records and numbers collapses with it. We actually have an echo of this after 9-11. If you do regressions on the American health care system, it turns out we all stopped getting sick after 9-11 at, at a very high statistical rate. And the reason is that the state and local governments had so many charges running around to do stuff reacting to the terrorism threat that they quit keeping records. It's a sign of a society under stress. And so something happens in the sixth century and this world that was evolving toward very intensive use of data collapses to a place where you have tiny little states where indeed the local baron sort of runs everything and the king is a whisper, very distant and not very effective. And that goes on until the Renaissance when people rediscover the Roman writers about the joys of organizing. If you're in the military, let's have a staff again. And they start doing this commerce across the, you know, particularly the Italian city-states, across huge geographic boundaries. And for that, you need things like double-entry bookkeeping, and the world begins to wake up again, or at least move back in this area, because who knows whether they were happier in the Middle Ages. But it begins to move back into this world where our ambitions are to do things across time and space. And for that, we have an ever-increasing appetite for data. And just as examples of the sort of end state of the Renaissance, Philip II, the guy who had the big empire, the Span ran the Spanish Empire in, uh, around the world, but, but certainly all over the New World, would get up at dawn and work till 9 o'clock. And his inbox, he had to read 2,000 pages a day of memos from the field, and he dictated 300 memos going out the other way, and that's what he did for the entire time that he was king. And Gustavus Adolphus, there's a brief period when the Swedes are the dominant power in Europe, and they, they basically chase all the other armies in the Thirty Years' War. No one can compete with them. And why is that? Because all the other armies in the Thirty Years' War always marched in the direction of the rich farmland because they had to pillage their way across the landscape. They couldn't just maneuver arbitrarily. And the Swedes had a staff system again. They had evolved something that looks very like modern, Amer uh, modern American or anybody else's military with a staff to plan and to, and to take in information about where we're headed and what it'll look like and whether there needs to be a bridge built before we get there. And all this stuff starts to reoccur again. And in a small way, like Alexander the Great, he has this brief temporary advantage because he's the only person in Europe who has an army that really does the Pentagon would now say information warfare, but more accurately, crunches information. It's not just, you know, the Battle of Hastings in the Middle Ages, the, the two armies met and they were about a thousand yards across. They didn't know how to fight in anything bigger than that. This ability starts to be reinvented, for better or for worse, as the hallmark of European modernity. And something new happens. 
In the old ancient world, there were, of course, very important observations. They worked out the, the, the radius of the Earth, but there weren't these sort of huge scientific projects. Tycho Brahe gets a uh, grant from the King of Denmark to do exquisite naked eye astronomy. And he takes all this data, and to reduce it, he needs a whole lot of trig functions. So he uses all these cool tricks that have been emerging from, um, uh, well, late medieval mathematics. People were beginning to work out algorithms for working out trig functions. And he's right at the cutting edge of that. But more importantly, his disciple, Kepler, wants to make a theory out of this. And he really needs to crunch Tycho's data. And we have these letters of a machine that is built for this need. So as soon as you had, it's a really interesting point, as soon as you had um, the big problem, you would think that you'd go 200 years before somebody said, well, maybe a machine could do this arithmetic, right? It seems actually to have been a very obvious idea. As soon as the problem arose, people thought about trying to find a way to mechanize it. The machine is uh, destroyed in a fire. It's never built. There are surviving letters, and this is some German professor's reconstruction, so-called, of what it would have looked like. Okay, so now we come to what is conventionally modernity, the end of the Thirty Years' War, 1648. I realize you can't push this data very hard, but I just think it's lovely that calculators appear immediately. And to show that uh, Pascal, all of you will have heard of him for his various inventions, the wheelbarrow, hydraulic press, barometer, probability theory, um, you know, to, to show that uh, Pascal is a transitional figure, uh, when he's born, his, uh, he was deformed. He, he, his skull never closed, and he was hunchbacked. And the parents were upset by this. And unlike modern parents, they understood the cause. The father was a lawyer. He had refused to represent some old crone who lived in the neighborhood. So they trotted down to her, and they asked her, have you bewitched our son? And in a very businesslike way, she said yes. Um, and they had a negotiation. And the crone explained that, well, you know, bewitching is a difficult thing. I could take the curse off him, but I have to transfer it to another animal. Uh, so can you bring a horse? And Pascal's father said, well, a horse is awfully expensive. Could we have a cat? And they went back and forth, and finally they had a cat, and then they dropped the cat as soon as it had been afflicted with Pascal's afflictions out a third story window to complete the cycle so that, you know, presumably this curse was extinguished with the cat. Um, so this is the world that he grew up in, and yet there's also this, this, this is the guy who builds the adding machine, right? So there's this lovely sort of, his life spans the official start of early modern Europe, and by golly, there seems to be something to it. Anyway, the father got a job as a tax collector, and this is one of these data jobs that wasn't very well known or famous in the society, but if you had it, you were miserable. And all he did all, all day and all night was these sums, and in those days you're doing this by firelight, and, you know, you get sick doing this, right? So it was just the bane of his life and the young genius who did not, of course, get healthier after the cat was exterminated. Um, the young genius looks at this and, and has a deep appreciation of the need. And, of course, he is a genius, too, so he thinks about the technology of it. And with his, in his own skull, he combines both the innovation about the user innovation, the thing that this is something that would be really a useful need. That's often not obvious with the technological innovation, hey, we could build something that matches this. And he builds a machine that adds and subtracts. And the idea is repeated all the way to the 20th century. It's very simple. You have two gear wheels. The first gear wheel, the dark one here, has only one tooth on it. And it clicks around. It's got a little ratchet on it, so it can't just move smoothly. It clicks over one, two, three, four, and 10 times it's back at its original starting position. And so what happens is, if this is the, if the dark blue wheel there is the one position, you can dial in one, two, three, four, five. It's counting for you. And it, you dial in nine, and then the tenth time, it pushes this other wheel forward one stroke, right? So you've got a carry there. You've got a mechanical thing that adds and carries. This is what your odometer does, and it's the basis for all adding machines. And basically, for all the, all the um, computer products, so-called, prior to real electronic calculators in the Second World War. And if you think this thing is kind of stupid, well, I suppose it is, but if you put a lot of gears and wheels together, you can do a lot. And in fact, the calculations for the atomic bomb, which was horrendously difficult, was done by human beings with mechanical calculators that were using this system, 
or rather a slightly improved version due to Leibniz, which looked like that. This is what one of the things actually looked, at, looked like. Uh, to dial in one of these numbers, you would uh, turn a wheel, and so you dial in the first wheel for your first number, then you would go over to another wheel, and you would dial in that number, and while you were doing it, the numbers in the first window would be changing, right? It's doing this add and carry business, and that's how it worked. <coughs> he managed to build them for 100 livres a, a piece. I don't have experience with that, but a soldier probably took about four or five months to get that as pay, and he was known to complain that he thought that that price was a little high. If it was lower, more people would use it. Clerks, of course, resisted this, and there was some talk that the units were slow and temperamental, and maybe that's why they weren't quite as good as they could be. But look, what's really interesting about this is that um, it did work well enough that a very intelligent man, Pascal, thought that he had a business in it. He went and got funding from his family to go chase it. And the real point was that the society had a relatively small need for doing these calculations. There were a few specialists who could do it in their head. They could, in fact, do it faster and usually more accurately. These machines missed once in a while. Uh, they could do it faster and more accurately than one of these machines, but that society wasn't in a place where it had to do lots and lots of these calculations, uh, and you needed sort of unskilled labor with the machine becoming something that's viable. So there's a sense in which in this V minus C picture of the world, it's a marginal technology, yes, but you ask, why didn't it catch on? It was a little bit expensive, and it was a simple society. Uh, Leibniz improves this thing. It's actually interesting. He's not primarily, it seems, motivated by patents. He's working for a, a German prince, and part of his good works is to improve the uh, German prince's little state, and so he does practical, useful things to enrich the kingdom, and this invention is one of them. And then later he does try to interest uh, people in buying this thing commercially. And basically, you know, he does mechanical improvements, and he also gets to where if you pull a lever several times, multiplication is just addition repeated, but the thing does multiplication and a kind of division. And he has this wonderful snobbish quote, which I just have to read to you. It is unworthy of excellent men to lose hours like slaves in the labor of calculation, which could easily be passed on to anyone else if machines were used. He's not saying the machines work better than the guys who are really, really smart and good at calculation. He's just saying that they have higher and better uses. And I would submit in his society probably wasn't true. Their higher and best use was about the equal to the value of one of these machines. All right, well, it didn't work, and what were the problems? The mechanical problem that you'll see in the books is that you can't cut gears quite well enough, and that leads to two problems. Um, if the gears are a little bit slack, every once in a while it doesn't count when it should. And so, you know, instead of getting the number 1,000, you only get 999 because there's play in the gears, and that accumulates over a course of, of uh, uses. Uh, and the other one is that the gears fit too tightly and the thing binds and jams and you have to send it out for repair. And indeed, these things were supposed to be temperamental. Um, there's a sense in which you should ask yourself, again, this is sort of a policy question, um, is this circular? The way people usually tell the story is, and then the watchmaking industry improved gears and suddenly everything was fine. Well, why did the watch industry improve gears, right? What was their motive? Why were they smarter than the people in the adding machine business? If there had been money to improve these things, a marginal technology would have been better. So you have to ask yourself, this is usually the, the, you know, the paradox in all these history questions, we can't replay the past, was it just that they didn't quite know how to do things well enough? I mean, they built working models, um, they thought that it was a commercial proposition, or was it just that, you know, there wasn't that much use for it in the society and indeed costs would come down over time? Um, there was a small market. I think that's the point, and you have to ask yourself at the time of Leibniz how much computing did the world actually need. All right. So there's a sequel to sort of flesh out these ideas. A guy named Thomas de Colmer in 1820 actually makes something that works pretty well, calls it an arithmometer. It's still one of these contraptions with wheels, and it has seven-figure accuracy, costs 150 bucks. Most people don't need seven-figure accuracy, but there are a few people in the society now who do, and engineers and insurance companies start buying this thing, and it's actually a modest commercial success. There's a nice benchmark. 
Babbage was actually interested in this. In 1820, the most complicated data processing center in the city of London was the Banking Clearing House. And what happened was that banks in the city of London would each have people who drew checks, and the checks would then be presented for payment, and all the banks would then say, well, I have a check from you, and the other bank would say, yes, and I have one of your checks, and it was a big mess. So what they would do originally is all the clerks from all the banks would show up at a certain copy house and compare checks and figure out which bank owed which bank net, right? You aren't going to pay all the money back and forth frantically. You're going to figure out who owes who net. And eventually that became too big a deal. And so it, by 1820, there was this clearinghouse where 35 clerks would sit all day and work out the banking for the entire city of London. All the checks would flow into that room, and they would do this math problem. And I guess they never closed. But at the end of the day, anyway, they would, they would do that. There's a sequel to this. In, by 1870, the railways are around, and they're doing business with each other frantically, too. And there's a railway clearinghouse. And the railway clearinghouse employs 1,300 clerks, and it does $5 million worth of business a day. All right? These are societies that are exploding in their use of data and information. And you have lot of large populations now of miserable clerks who will see the value in doing this mechanically if you possibly can. Clearly, the, the increased opportunity for V is some part of this story. Hey, Steve, this is a, can I make a comment? Please. I mention, this is you know, another great project idea. This comes to mind because the founding chair of our department who passed away a few years ago, a guy named Jerry Noe, in 1950 or so, came back after World War II and went to work for SRI, and he was in charge of the team that uh, built this machine called IRMA for the Bank of America. And it was the first computerized check processing. And so they'd been using mechanical, essentially card sequence machines up till then. The volume had increased, but again, it's a repetition of exactly the story that you're telling. Uh, and one of the uh, innovations of the IRMA project is those squirrely little numbers on the bottom of a check that you can't quite read, which were machine readable. But um, you know, paper check handling machines, and uh, you know, uh, again, computing in the 50s, they built their own computers for the Bank of America. They, in fact, built originally one vacuum tube and one transistor machine, and they gave up on the transistor machine because they weren't sufficiently reliable. But uh, there, there's a modern version of this story, which is now only 50 years old, in which uh, banking checking accounts were suddenly made far more ubiquitous because it used prior to that every check was lovingly handled by somebody or not lovingly handled as the case may be right and and so if you look at the rise of american history another way to tell the same point is you know all the household names we grew up with are sort of mid-19th century and later. I mean, there's a wave now, obviously, from the dot-coms. But if you think about the companies that were big in the, in the 1960s and 70s, these great commercial American names, um, they're all uh, products of the late 19th century. And they get into businesses like <coughs> insurance, which is all about keeping actuarial tables. And they have operations that are across the country. It's not like I'm sitting in my little cracker barrel and I can see everything in my store and I don't need a lot of fancy records, right? You begin having this Alexander the Great impulse to have empires of business that span the continent. And when those things arrive, then sooner or later they figure out that they have a need to control data better. And the calculator business, which is clearly the simplest form of computing, takes off in a big way at this point. So the next jump is there's a guy named Dor E. Felt who gets the idea that what are we doing with these wheels? Wouldn't the keyboard be faster? And this is clearly a technological innovation and pushes the whole thing ahead. And he invents something called a Comptometer, which actually you had to go to school for like three months to learn how to use. But once you did, your fingers just flew, right? They have old photographs, old movies of people doing Comptometer stuff, and you can't see their hands. They're all blurred. They could do this much faster than they could write. And the last people who could do that, you know, it was a life skill, right? And they went out of business sometime in the 50s. So, you know, he comes in and makes a really mass market business out of this. And the next example, the one we all know, is William S. Burroughs, uh, grandfather of the guy who wrote the avant-garde novels. Uh, and he's another example of somebody who knew how miserable this job was. He actually tried and failed to go into banking because he just couldn't stand it. 
uh, and he started doing metalworking instead. And again, within his skull, he was able to innovate not just the technological innovation, but the social innovation that, gosh, can we automate banking? And he ends up penetrating the market pretty quickly. Um, I think the advantage of an adding machine is that you know, if I have one working model, I can show you it works. There's no real uncertainty about that. Uh, so he ends up having 130,000 machines by 1908. So this is after 20 years work. And what he does is he has 58 models and he brags one built for every line of business. I'll learn your needs. This is the thing about capitalism, right? It has a kind of backhanded altruism. I wake up every morning trying to figure out what my customers want. Not necessarily because I love them, but it comes out in the same place. Um, so Burroughs is, builds his success on learning for every business their peculiar needs and bringing the technology around to where it can serve them. And this is a theme, I think, to the present day, but clearly for the next few lectures. Um, so, um, this is a success story. It's a success story for patents, right? Almost all of these things are sold under patent to the private sector. And the thing about the, the patent system is, you know, Leibniz kept telling his boss, um, gee, look at all the good stuff I'm doing for the kingdom. His boss might be skeptical. He might say, well, I don't know. Is anybody using this stuff? How do I know if I invest in it? It's a good idea. Maybe you just like tinkering and building stuff and collecting a check. How do I know this will ever be useful, right? That's a problem. Uh, people who get paid by patents don't cheat that way, right? Because if they never end up selling the thing, it's an inherent, it has a kind of inherent honesty. If they don't manage to find this user base to figure out these user needs, the patent doesn't reward them. You only get paid if you build the thing. And so that's a very nice feature. And in the world of adding machines, that turns out to be a very useful incentive system. And I already mentioned this, but the Manhattan Project, which is clearly the most technically demanding calculation to that time, is done with adding machines. So it's a very powerful technology. OK. So let's be a little more careful about policy. We just learned a story about patents. Well, first of all, they're good at getting people to determine private needs. That's one moral. Um, there is a technical glitch. A patent is a monopoly on the invention. If you do the math, you will find that a monopolist can only recover about half the value of his invention to society unless you know, special things happen. But in the general instinct is a monopoly can only give you about half the value that consumers receive. Um, and what that means is that what if V minus C is three quarters, right? Or is one quarter? You need more than the monopoly return from a patent to induce you to invest in the cost of the invention. If that's true, patents aren't going to help you. And that's kind of a fancy point, but for really expensive, marginal kinds of inventions, the patent system actually has a hard time giving you a big enough reward. There's a second thing which is worth pointing out. Patents are great for what people call ex ante uh, efficiency. We want people, before the thing has been invented, we want to encourage people to invent the thing. But, but after the thing exists, we don't like having a patent monopoly because it makes the thing more expensive than it needs to be. Once the invention exists, once the idea exists, we'd like to give it away at what price? Zero so that lots of people can make copies and as many people as possible can use it. We'd like existing inventions to be done at a low price. Patents have a cost. You have this temporary admitted monopoly, but for 20 years you have a temporary monopoly. Once the thing has been invented, you know, you might wish that there weren't a monopoly. Now in patents you don't have any choice, but a close cousin of patents which we'll come into is prizes. And with a prize, if the government puts up a prize for inventing the thing, and you can have prizes based on how many units are sold, there's nothing to keep you from doing that, then afterwards it's paid for out of tax dollars. And indeed, the, the afterwards, the, the thing is available at zero cost. The information, once it's achieved, is given out for free. We'll come across examples of that. Um, and finally, there's a point which I think I'll reserve, uh, which is that Calculators are simple objects, and they're pretty easy to see if one works. You don't have a lot of trouble attracting inventors. Every other form of computing machinery that we're going to talk about tonight is not like that. You have this complicated object that you're going to build, and maybe it works, and maybe it doesn't. And if you do build it, it's not clear that anyone will buy it. 
<coughs> and people have a horrendous time getting financing in that environment. And you need financing if you're chasing patents, right? The patent only pays you after you've sold the thing. It doesn't help with the R&D costs up front. And you'll see that uh, what in the jargon is called information asymmetry. The inventor knows this is worth something, but the bank lender doesn't is a huge barrier toward pushing this industry forward, in particular getting financing. Okay. So we come to the part that you know, you've been waiting for, the, uh, Babbage and all that good stuff, the 19th century. There is a little bit of prehistory I want to pick up. There is this ancient human idea about building machines that act like people and animals. It goes back to the Greek myth, Hephaestus, Vulcan in, mythology, in Roman mythology, built all sorts of metal servants. Uh, the Jews in medieval mythology built a golem. And Albertus Magnus, and frankly, everybody who ever made a, any kind of calculating machine prior to the 18th century was supposed to have an iron doorkeeper that he had built to be his robot slave kind of thing. So the idea of automata is all mixed up with magic. The Library of Alexandria had a lot of artisans who built these things. They were very famous. People get experience building medieval clocks. An automaton is basically a scaled-down clock. Leonardo da Vinci flirts with these things. Um, the great artists of this are Julian Turiano, who did water-powered stuff, and Hans Bullmann, who used clockwork to make these automata. And you would have uh, dancers and animals and all sorts of lifelike things. They, they had machines that would write your signature with an intricate series of cams. All sorts of work done in this uh, early modern, late medieval world um, to uh, uh, make these seemingly useless objects, but very cool and entertaining. And Rene Descartes actually builds a whole theology out of this, saying, you know, animals are just automata, and eventually humans will be able to make animals, but of course we have souls, we're different. Um, this takes an interesting bounce. And there's a Frenchman named Bouchon who uses this technology of automata to make punched cards. What he does is he looks at music boxes where you remember the pins stick up. And he says, well, yeah, and the opposite of that would be holes, and the pins would go into the surface of the cylinder. And he uses a punch card system to start experimenting with something to make weaving easier. Um, and of course, the weavers resist this mightily, and, and everybody in the weaving industry has these stories about how he's chased by mobs and beaten. That's how they did industrial relations in those days. Uh, but he's the first guy to try and automate weaving, and is moderately successful. The Weaving Guild, by the way, used a series of prizes. It was run by the state and was incredibly innovative, French weaving, much more so than any of the other countries of Europe. And they had this very sophisticated prize system for eliciting progress in things that improve weaving, including what we would now call sort of the antecedents of computing. And the sort of the king of the automata world, the absolute highest point of this is a man named de Vaucanson, who builds three automata in his life, but they're all exquisite. And he has a duck that eats and then excretes. And he actually believes that he's learning something about human physiology. And if he builds enough of these automata, he'll be able to treat disease. But he gets bored with that, and they make him director of the state silk mills, where he, in turn, comes up with new ways of doing automated weaving machinery and gets beaten by various unhappy weavers. <laughs> <laughs> the king of this subject is, of course, Jacquard, who wanted to be a weaver originally, set out to do it, but couldn't stand the concentration for 12 hours at a stretch getting just the right uh, thread delivered in this very complicated, they would do 12 threads at a time, and he just never got the knack of it. It was a miserable experience, and he went off to be a mechanic instead. But he understood this need, so he makes a fishing net machine, which he is rewarded with a pro both a prize and a patent. Um, and the next thing is that he makes a pattern loom, building on the work of uh, de Vacasson and others. And this promptly leads to riots in the short term. Uh, first downturn in business, everybody goes and burns all the looms. But two years later, there are 11,000 of these things in operation. And you know he shows very complicated objects. After he dies, they make a portrait of him that is a meter by a meter and a half. And the portrait ends up hanging in Babbage's living room. But you can see the connection between weaving and computing uh, 
right there. I've never actually seen a reproduction of this thing as apparently lost, but they said it was like a tin type. You couldn't really, unless you stuck your nose right up against it, realize that this thing wasn't a photograph. All right. So what do we take from this history with, with looms? Well, it starts with automata, and they're useless things, and you can't really patent useless things, right? What's the market? Um, what they, these things were done as for as toys for rich people or your patron. A lot of people like to have an intellectual around at their court. Uh, they would bid for these people. Euler w went to Frederick the Great because Frederick the Great said he had to have the smartest man in Europe and he had the deepest pocketbook. So they would hire these people and then they'd say do something clever and it took this form a lot of the time. And if you didn't have a patron, well if you could build one of these things, people would figure out you're a pretty darn good clockmaker and soon you would have a patron. So those were the kinds of incentives and that makes a kind of sense in a world where these things are never going to be a mass product. Patents aren't really very useful for that. It's a kind of government research basically, but you're doing things that are playthings. that you don't, none of these people thought this would lead to anything. Well, they thought it would lead to a cure for cancer or something. You'd understand biology. It's a kind of God's laughter, right? This turns out to be something that leads to computing. Um, if you wanted to be very kind about this, an idea that we'll return to in the, in the lectures, you could say that there's a kind of lead user dynamic, that the rich people in every time and epoch have very sophisticated tastes, and if you want to find out where the market is headed, the markets that don't quite exist but society is evolving toward, well, go to the rich people, and the fact that they'll use one of these automata may be some clue that automata technology is useful in general. I think that's pushing the model, but as we go into the, the more modern parts of this lecture, um, that becomes a very convincing view that there are these certain groups of lead users who help manufacturers know what market they should be serving. And then, of course, we've already talked about this, but it's very interesting that the French, in the time of Napoleon and a little after, also before, uh, would laugh at the British and say, what are you using patents for? Prizes are much better. And in fact, they had a good story. The first people to come up with photography was Daguerre, Daguerreotypes. You've all seen these old photographs in, in, in France. And across the channel, there was a process that looked very much like modern photography. And the Englishman who came up with the pseudo-modern photography process got a patent, spent the next year suing people to stop using his patented technology. It never acquired a base of users. Meanwhile, across the channel, the French gave Daguerre a prize, said, here's your money, now give a lecture on how to do this thing, and Daguerre types became the standard for the world. And so it is not true, I don't want to convince you of the opposite thing, that prizes are always better than patents. But there is a space where that's a convincing argument. And the use of prizes in this automata world, which isn't very natural for patents anyway, is a kind of interesting historical experiment. Can I ask you a question about prizes, Please. Steve? Yeah. In the case of modern prizes, like the Ansari X Prize, mm -hmm. did they demand that the results of the work go in the public domain? Or does, do, does McCready and Paul Allen have a set of patents, for example, on the space plane? So are they getting the best of both worlds, a, a prize and a patent portfolio? Yeah, they are. And we tend to do that a lot. I, I mean, that's sort of the instinct of buy dole, right? That we, we pay university researchers to do work, and then we let them patent it. And there are special stories where you might want to do that, and we'll come across some of them in computing where that has bite. Uh, what I would say in the shorthand way is you might want them to do that if the prize isn't big enough, right? I'm sorry, it just doesn't have enough money to create a race that's purely prize-based. They have to have this space tourism thing on the side, not because that's the right way to, to set up a prize, but because they basically don't have a big enough budget to do a full-scale prize. That's one story. And the other one is, gee, you know, a prize is great when the prize giver knows what he's trying to achieve. But I've spent a lot of this lecture saying, no, the really interesting innovation is finding out what the society needs. That's an innovation, too. And in that world, you might want to mix in patents because it keeps people honest. It keeps them looking. They'll still fail if they don't find people out in the world other than the prize giver who they're pleasing. But that's the kind of flavor of the discussion. You're right. Okay, so now we come to Babbage, the hero of our story, and he's this wonderful Victorian eccentric. He's born into a banking family, so this is ideal, right? He has a, a deep appreciation for the painfulness of these problems, and he's also incredibly connected with the establishment, so at least twice when he's pursuing his machines, he gets to have a sit-down with the Prime Minister of England, uh, different prime ministers at various times, 
Um, but, you know, he has access to the corridors of power and the establishment and the scientific establishment, and he also hobnobs with all the contemporary poets and intellectuals. Uh, he has this seminal moment when he's like eight years old. There's this wonderful connection. He goes to uh, Thomas Merlin's Museum of Marvels and sees a dancing ballerina automata. And he knows after that that that's his destiny, and eventually he buys the thing, and that's in his living room that he proudly shows to everyone along with Jacquard's portrait. He's a little bit of a crank. He's a Victorian eccentric. Uh, and what he does is he hates mistakes in published scientific papers. So he spends his life checking the map and writing angry letters whenever he finds uh, a problem in, um, in, in some of the data that's issued at the back of these papers. So you can see why he'd like to automate the process. And late in life, he gets this idea that he hates street musicians. Well, we all hate mimes. So he's just ahead of his time. Um, and, and he... And he keeps complaining to what passed for cops in those days that, you know, these street musicians are annoying. And so what happens, there's this very touching moment when he's in his deathbed. Every street musician in the city of London comes beneath his window and serenades him on the way out. <laughs> he actually could do cool stuff. He worked on building a chess player and a, and a tic-tac-toe machine. He thought that was easier than computing. Ask IBM, it goes the other way. He had the idea, it seems to have been the first human being to figure out that the cost of postage is not about how many horses it takes you, how far it is between the places you're sending the letter. It's the sorting. It's the data operation in the middle. So he's the first person to suggest the penny post. He has a big influence on actuarial tables, loudly complaining that the insurance companies of the time, which were few and badly organized, really didn't have it right. Um, he invents a speedometer. He invents the cow catcher. Uh, he becomes the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, Newton's old chair, and he writes papers in physics, geology, and mathematics, not a stupid person. Uh, he <coughs> loses his wife early, uh, and he takes on later in his middle age as a sort of daughter figure at a Countess of Lovelace. She is Byron's daughter, Lord Byron the poet. In a sort of best Hollywood spin management uh, tradition, Byron had this small problem that he was sleeping with his half-sister. People didn't think that that was very good, so he thought he would avoid that whole story by marrying frantically some woman in the landed aristocracy. Add as the uh, product of that marriage, he sees her once when she's uh, one year old and never sees either the mother or the daughter again, but he does sort of leave this wild gene with Addis. So in addition to being a mathematical prodigy, very well educated in mathematics, uh, she also uh, is a compulsive gambler and drug user and has sort of disastrous affairs, very Byronic, right? And in the end has this very sad ending where she ends up with uh, uterine cancer uh, and her mother says, see, this is a punishment for the way you've lived. She's not the Byron side of the family and lets her die like that without benefit of drugs in a room with, like, you know, mattresses on the walls, let her scream. So it's a very sad story, ultimately, but in this period when she's with Babbage, fighting is like is not with Babbage, but they always made up. When she's fighting with Babbage, she makes probably some technical uh, contributions to his work, but more importantly, she writes it down in an organized, systematized, clear way that it never came from the man himself. And you have this record for the 20th century, else he would be forgotten. So that's the two of them. And Babbage has this wonderful idea. It's two wonderful ideas, but the first one is for something called a difference engine. And he's sitting around in college, and he's saying, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if all these numbers could be crunched by steam? Um, and there's a very big social reason at this point to have a difference engine. Um, you're beginning to get military power tied to doing complicated science problems, more exactly ballistics problems. If I fire this thing at this angle, where will the shot fall? And navigation tables. And the French are in the head of this race. There's a, a guy named De Prony who organizes human beings as a kind of calculator. He has the very smart guys at the top come up with an algorithm for the efficient way to calculate these navigation tables. He has guys in the middle as sort of a foreman, 
and he has a bunch of very lowbrow middling people, not that a good a mathematician, doing the actual calculation. And the French have these wonderful tables for navigation, and the advantage is so huge that you know you see the British Marines charging onto the sinking French ship to grab a copy of this navigation table and take it back so that it can be used in a British warship. And you would think, well, you get one of those and you can copy it. Not so fast. There are no Xerox machines then. So if you let the British just copy the thing and publish their own version, errors would come in because it's not well proof checked, right? That's the other curse of this business. And Babbage goes around because he loves collecting sort of examples of how horrible tables are. Uh, th errors that are 300 years old that have been copied from table to table to table that were wrong the first time that the first table was printed. And they keep messing up scientific experiments or appear in tables published in China. Uh, data, these calculated tables are really awful. And so what Babbage says is, look, let's make a machine that first calculates it without mistake and equally importantly, prints it or rather makes a copper plate so that we can print books from this thing. So there's no human intervention because as soon as there's human intervention, we have these errors and we've got to get ahead of the Frenchman. And the way to do that is to automate calculating these navigational tables. And his idea is the so-called method of differences. Most of you will have heard about this, but let me just show it to you because it's kind of pretty. You can figure it out for yourself if you know things like Taylor functions. But here's the way it works. Suppose I want to calculate the cube of some number. Well, 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. And I define this thing called the first difference, which is the difference between, let me get this right, uh, is the difference between 1 and 8 or 7. Okay? And then I have a second difference, which is the difference between the first differences. And I go on until I get to this thing called the third difference. And then something kind of wonderful happens. If I add all these numbers together, I get the next cube. And now, of course, I can just do the subtractions to get my first difference and second difference and third difference again. And I can go forever working out cubes of really, really large numbers. I start at 64, but I can play this game forever. I have reduced a difficult thing, doing cubes, to a subtraction problem. And you know, this is the story of technology, right? We've moved the problem around to something we know how to do, or Babbage thinks he knows how to do. This is the same technology you basically had from uh, uh, Pascal. Now you can do subtraction. This is how we're going to do cubes. And of course, you can do squares and, and the fourth power of stuff. And if you can do that, then we have these wonderful approximations for trigonometric functions and everything else. We can do everything. We can just do the powers of these numbers. So that's his idea, to do it for these tables. He has the idea in 1812, as I say. He builds a prototype in 1822. And he comes to the government and says, let me build this thing. Government says, I have no idea whether you can do this. But you're a member of the establishment. You wouldn't lie to us intentionally. Let's get better information. How do we do this? We hire the Royal Astronomical Society to tell us in a report whether you can do this. And they look at this prototype he's built and they say, yep, he can do it. He can scale it up. And of course, scaling it up turns out to be tremendously difficult because it's easy to make a small one. But when you have lots of gears, you have the same problem that the errors in the tolerances of the gears add up and you have to get higher and higher tolerances. So it turns out to be very difficult. But while he's chasing this thing, he gets grants from the British government in the amount of 17,000 pounds, claims to spend a like amount of his own money um, to build it. And you know, can you say to him, well, why don't you go out and get a patent and sell it? And he says quite reasonably, no, there's only one, maybe two problems in the world that this is good for. It's good for the sailors. The Royal Navy will fund this. They do in the end. And it might be good for scholars, but I can't ever sell this commercially. In a world like that, give me a grant. And indeed, that's how computers are made all along. And it's not so unreasonable. It's a good system. Tolerance is the problem. And he more or less gives up on the project in 1833, but only famously because he thinks he has a better idea. So this is a picture of what it would have looked like. Uh, it would have had a crank on it. It, would be, it still wasn't power-driven equipment. And all of these things are decimal wheels, right? Uh, each of them clicking around just in the same old mode until they get have gone one full circuit and then they tip the next one over. Another picture of the thing. 
and they actually build one. Babbage doesn't, but there's a Swede named Georg Scheutz who sees this thing and thinks it's wonderful, and he gets money from the Swedish Academy, and they actually build a copy for the British government about 1850 for only 1,700 pounds, right? So it turns out that, uh, gee, Babbage, maybe technology got better, but anyway, it's now quite cheap. The British spent 17,000 pounds doing this. Uh, Scheutz makes one for 1,700. Maybe he should have spent something like 2,500. The gears aren't quite good enough. It makes occasional errors. Uh, but it's used to do astronomy. It's ultimately sold to an observatory in, uh, in uh, New York and life expectancy tables for the British government. These problems repeat into the 20th century, right? The society only has a few of these big number problems. So the thing Babbage is famous for, of course, is this analytical engine that's different. He drops this idea of the difference engine and he says, you know, what if we could have the machine uh, follow what we would now call a program, right? That we have cards that say, oh, send the number to the adder unit so it can be added to another uh, uh, number, and then why don't you put those in memory, and then we'll do another calculation, then we'll take the first pair of numbers out of memory, and we'll do all this in a, in a calculated way, and his big invention is it's conditional. He says, if the number is bigger than seven, then this operation will happen. If it's smaller than seven, some other operation will happen. This idea of conditional logic is, is the heart of modern computers. I'm hard to say this in the same room psychically with Ed, but I think I know that much about computing. And Babbage has that idea. There's a charming language he uses. This all comes from textiles, right? I mean, who are the tech professionals of the 19th century? It's these textile mills. So Babbage says that the numbers uh, will be drawn from the store, that's what he calls memory, and sent to the mill. That's where all the addition and multiplication and stuff takes place. All of this is sort of yarn rhetoric. And this has a huge... Uh, impact on the Victorian mind when Ada writes it up this way, the idea of weaving numbers becomes just uh, you know, the sort of popular science of the 1850s lapped it up. This was an image that appealed to the Victorian mind. And they tinker with this thing off and on to 1906. So uh, you know, they don't seriously pursue it after Babbage's death, but they are tinkering with this thing. It's an idea that's sort of at the edges of what people know is possible or might be possible. This is a, a computer program for it. It's basically what I showed you. You have one class of cards that these, these basically read numbers in. So the first card says place A, we're doing the problem A, B plus C quantity D, right? Uh, calculate that sum. So the first card says, okay, move A into the memory, move B into the memory, move C into the memory, move D into the memory. And then the next card says, okay, now move A back out of memory to this mill where you're going to do the computation. Bring B from the memory out to the mill. Um, and then you have a third kind of card that tells the mill to multiply these things together. And it goes on like this in the last instruction. The last card says go to the printer. So if you just type up enough cards, you can tell this thing to do any arbitrary equation because, of course, it doesn't have to be quantity A, B plus C times D, it can be all sorts of functions, and you can do this on cards, and the same machine will do it without being rearranged, and that's actually incredibly modern. Uh, most of the computers, even the early electronic ones, uh, you know, you have big chunks of the computer on pallets being wheeled around so it can be plugged in somewhere else. The idea of doing this in an automated way is actually wonderfully ahead of its time. Um, Again, there are clearly technical difficulties. You can get historians to go both ways on whether this thing was physically possible when Babbage tried to build it. Um, but there are some interesting policy parts of the story. The first one is the government is tremendously skeptical. They should be, right? You didn't build the simple thing you promised to build. Now you'd like more money to build the better thing. Uh, and what they do is the same thing they did before. Get yourself some expert to see if Babbage is off his rocker. Unfortunately, they go to the Astronomer Royal who says it's rubbish, it's not good for anything, and that's sort of the end of government funding. He never gets another dime from the British government and tries to do it on his own hook, but you know doesn't build a lot of stuff because he can't afford it. Um, very shrewd thing about the difference engine, um, it's all done on grants, basically. And if you're not going to send it, try and sell this to the whole society, if there's only one customer and it's the government, well, in a sense, you're doing the work for that one customer. It's an e easy transaction. There's no second copy you're going to build. I know what I want, and I'm paying you to do this. This is surely an intelligible economic transaction. 
Grants are very sensible in this mode, and very sophisticated. Babbage points out to the government right at the beginning, look, only the Royal Navy is going to use this stuff. So he really understood, you know, he had a very good policy argument for why it should be done in grant mode. Um, and for the analytical engine, you know, maybe the Astronomer Royal was right. There was really no problem that existed in Victorian England. No one's really suggested one that needed this invention. The difference engine would have had identifiable problems. Babbage pretty much thought that the analytical engine was cool. And as a starving British taxpayer on the verge of subsistence circa 1855, I'm not sure I would have given him a few more of my pennies, right, so that he could do this sublime thing so that people in the late 20th century could examine his cleverness, but I would have no more food on my table, right? This is not a bad instinct. Okay. Um, should we stop for a short break at this time, Ed? Let's. All right, so five minutes? Okay, welcome back. I'll pass it around with its instruction book and you can take it home. So we're now in the latter part of the 19th century and society is becoming more complex like crazy and it has these new needs. And the hero of our piece is Herman Hollerith, mainly because that's where IBM ultimately comes from. It could be the villain too, it depends how you feel about IBM. And there's this interesting problem. The American Constitution says that we have to have this census every 10 years. And it gets to be 1887, and nobody's finished the 1880 census. And this really panics them, right? Because we will get this one done before the next census. But the country keeps growing, and we've got to do something about this. And there's a second, um, you know, so we have to do something. And what turns out to happen, of course, is you start mechanizing the, the data handling. Um, there's a second reason, and that is that, you know, why did governments get in this business to begin with? Why did ancient governments get in the, rec in the records business? Because they want to control stuff. And you have all these raging arguments in the 1890s about farm policy. And you don't know whether small farms are more efficient than big ones. You don't have any data on this. And you surely can't pass laws and govern, and you can't have political arguments unless you have data on this. And so there's a big pressure on the census to become more sophisticated, to do something other than just count heads. Um, Herman Hollerith starts off as a young man, as a, cons a consultant to the Census Bureau, going out and collecting data for them, seeing what it's like to mess with these cards. Again, so you have this, this uh, uh, motif of the guy who knows how miserable it is to do it by hand. He then, I don't think he's actually a professor, but he teaches at MIT um, and starts building machines uh, that can handle census kinds of data, that can count up lots and lots of individual observations. I got this information from house one and more information from house two and three and four and n, and what's the sum of all those things. And he starts with paper tape, but you can't shuffle paper tape, so he goes to uh, paper cards. And those cards, which you've all seen, right, the standard size card is the size that a dollar bill was in, uh, in the 1890s. So fossilized into the standard for punch cards is the size of the currency. Because if you're going to buy drawers and stuff that are already sized for dollar bills, well, now you can use them for punch cards. There's some reason to have that size and not others. But of course, once you have them, the whole world adopts that standard. And you know, until the time we stopped using cards entirely, they were always the size of dollar bills in the 1890s. Uh, he knows this rich history of Jacquard looms, and he thinks up this solution for reading punched stuff in a card. So the census reader goes out, and he sees there are three kids. Under the kids column, he punches the three hole. How do you read that? Well, he has a little metal rod that if there's a hole, it falls through into a little cup of mercury and completes a circuit. And that's how the first Hollerith machines read these cards. And you can see up here, this is a Hollerith machine. And there are these little dials up here. And every time a card goes racing through the machine, the relevant counters, one of these dials for every place a hole could be in the card, clicks over if there's a hole in the card and not otherwise. And you can watch the machine continue to count these cards as they go racing through. Um, Hollerith has a very complex invention. And you come to the first place. Um, that raising capital is not easy, right? How do I know this thing works that you say you're going to build? In any way, why would anybody but the Census Bureau want one? 
Um, he does manage. So what he does is basically he gets money, first of all, from his brother-in-law, who immediately regrets the investment and keeps chiding him, give me my money back. And actually, up to about 1911, Hummler is still is always, his company is always cash poor. Uh, very hard to get outside financing to convince people that what they know is a good investment really is a good investment. That's a limit on how fast his business grows. That's a policy lever if you're thinking about why it isn't growing as fast as maybe society would like it to. Um, he does... So what happens is he does a, a, a demonstration project. He has a, builds a sorter, a card sorter that sorts cards of a predetermined description for the Baltimore Health Department. And they've collected stuff about the health of all their citizens, and they have this huge stack of information and no way to collate it. Find me all the people who live in this place and have this disease. They have no way to do that. They certainly can't do arbitrary searches. So he thinks that's the first thing, that's the smallest thing I can automate and make this work. And he does that. And immediately New York and in New Jersey and the War Department want to have that same capability. So it's an early success. And he builds enough of these machines that he's ready to build something for the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau has a prize competition, the prize idea. Let's get all the best ideas in the society, and we'll give a prize for the best one. <coughs> he wins the prize. He gets to do the 1890 census. And he does this curious thing, which is that he rents the machines to the Census Bureau for $1,000 a year. But every day that they're down, he has to pay them back $10. And what's that about? Well, in the jargon, that's also about information asymmetry, right? Uh, if I make a contract with you, you tell me it's a wonderful machine, and I buy the machine, I'm stuck with it. They don't really trust this technology. There's not a lot of experience with it. And frankly, Hollerith knows a lot more about whether it works than they do. And he'd be saying they're great machines no matter what. So you write a contract with this odd lease provision. You don't ever buy the machine. And there's a penalty if you don't perform. And if you think about it, we'll go into this more. That's IBM's mode all through the 20th century. They continue to do it this way. And one reason for that is that this is really at the frontiers of knowledge. The consumers really don't know if this machine will work as advertised. And the company has to come up with ways, sometimes expensive ways, that require internal financing, right? If I don't sell the machine to you, if I lease it, then I have to have enough capital to stand waiting for those lease payments to add up to the value of the machine. I'm floating you for 10 years. Um, you know, because of the nature of this business, um, financing is always an issue. And you have to do deals with customers because they don't trust you, because they can't just look at the machine and say, see, it works, or even that it would be useful to them. So anyway, he has the 1890 census, makes a lot of money. This being America, people start grumbling that he's making too much money. The 1900 census comes around. And he makes more money, but people start grumbling that it's a monopoly. Um, and they point out that, you know, the cost per unit of the 19, 1890 and 1900 censuses, they were done fast, but they weren't done much cheaper than the 1880 census. And anybody who knows American government will know why that is. But you've got this wonderful punch card equipment in the Census Bureau quick ask 15 more questions that you could include in the 1890 census so that their budget didn't go up. God forbid your budget goes down in Washington, right? Uh, so they figured out ways that, you know, the cost would be the same, but they were much more capable censuses. But, of course, his critics don't really think much of that. Um, and he gets for his commercial affairs something that's almost like a venture capitalist called the Library Bureau, a company that's willing to buy the machines from him and then lease them to the outside world. Basically, they're a source of financing. They've studied him much more carefully than a bank, and they're willing to bet their own business that he can make this thing work. So you have this world where he's a dynamite success with the Census Bureau, and he eventually quickly goes to the Russian Census and the French Census, and all the other Census Bureaus on the planet. Austria isn't on here, but they're, they're one of them. And that's easy, because they've seen that it works for one Census Bureau. But of course, this is something that he thinks, and this is where computing becomes interesting, um, he thinks it's also these giant new corporations would like this too. So what does he do? He goes to the New York Central, and he says, you know, you would really like one of my machines. And they say, yeah, why? And they say, well, I don't think it'll do anything for me. What are the benefits of this fancy way of doing stuff? We think our accounting system's pretty good. Um, and anyway, how do we know your machines work? He says, tell you what, I have some financing. I'll put the machine in your office for six months, and if you don't like it, you can give it back. Asymmetric information again. He's making this investment to persuade the customer 
that it really is in the customer's interest. The customer would like to believe him, but Hollerith has all the information. Now, the New York Central Railroad has thousands of locations, thousands of assets, and four million freight bills, four million transactions with customers every year. It's hugely complicated. And it thought it was doing pretty well, but you know, it would, always, it would have to wait sort of a month to figure out whether all its bills had been paid. Um, they did things in sort of a monthly cycle, and that was all the better anyone can do, and they thought it was good enough because they'd never seen better. But when Holleris machine comes in, they can do standard reports, right? Weekly. And they're just amazed by that. And they do, however, tell Hollerith, you know, it's fine to count stuff, but we have to do sums in addition. And so Hollerith starts changing the capabilities of his machines. He starts adding addition capability, which was not very important for the Census Bureau, but the railroad wants it. And so he's one of these innovators whose innovation is not just that he builds this thing that counts cards, counts the holes in cards, but he also realizes this need and then turns around and says, yep, you're right, I'm not going to be doctrinaire about this. Didn't have an ad addition facility uh, when I came to you, but now that you mention it, customer's always right. I'll build one. All the sort of usual suspects of big database, <coughs> late 19th century industry are involved. Insurance companies with their actuarial tables, U.S. Steel, Marshall Field, the department store, huge inventory problems. And government helps. How does government help the way government usually helps? Um, they get around to regulating the railroads and they start demanding that railroads provide all sorts of information. And there's a place where the ICC is beating on all the railroads in 1902 and they say, give me all the following reports and all the guys walk out of the room shaking their heads except one railroad the New York Central which says, fine. And the other railroads suddenly discover that the New York Central has had this wonderful competitive advantage. They've had this machine of course, it wasn't in their interest to brag about it, right? So they've had this machine, and, and it makes them much more efficient. They know where their rolling stock is. They don't lose it for long periods of time. Their bills go out promptly. They know exactly how much money is in the bank. They can work out which of their employees is, doing, is efficient and which one isn't. They can do all this stuff, crunching their data, which the other railroads with their sort of, we'll figure it out in a month, can't do. And what finally tips every other railroad in the country into doing that is you need this control in order to do government reporting for regulation. And remember the early years of the 20th century is about progressivism, right? There's a lot more government regulation and this drives things. The other thing which was a big boon to the adding industry, anybody who's ever gone to see their accountant knows this, is the income tax, right? It was a huge thing for the adding machine industry. Every accountant in the world went out and bought one because the government had put them all in the business of doing the income tax. Um, driven by this customer demand, Hollerith Company starts making more and more things that operate on cards. So you get something called an accumulator. That's this basic thing for counting stuff that the, that the patent service, uh, that the Census Bureau wanted. You have key punch. I want to start by inputting data onto cards. Well, I need a device to do that. You have sorters. And you have this adding punch. So what you have is a card with two numbers on it. You put it in the machine. The machine does the sum and, and punches right in the same card the answer, the total of the first two numbers you had on there. And eventually, around the 1920s, you start having stuff that, that prints out. That was, by the way, Burroughs' big invention, right, that he made the first uh, calculators, hand calculators that could print. Hollerith gets around to doing that in the 20s. Okay. Um, so what are the policy implications of this? This is a really interesting problem for the Census Bureau. They built this technology, and the technology would never have been built if it was just so it could be sold to the New York Central Railroad in the private sector, right? The total V needed to cover Hollerith C includes both this huge government demand and also a not insignificant commercial demand. And having those things together is what made this technology possible. But if I'm the Census Bureau, I say, great, you're selling all these civilian units on the side. Um, give me the lowest price, right? How do you divide that profit? How does the, gover does the government get the benefit of all those civilian sales, or does Hollerith charge the government a big price, and then the civilian sales are gravy? Well, we know what the government feels about that, but that's an issue. Um, we talked about 
asymmetric information, but the thing that's worth pointing out is this whole practice of renting machines, which is very costly for the company, is about the fact that the company knows a lot more about this technology than the buyer does, and the buyer needs to be assured, and that means that the, go that the company needs to be able to be in this machine rental business, which means that it needs a lot of capital, and the rub is that the lending companies are real reluctant to give this capital. So you end up in this business with capital-starved computer companies that need the capital so that they can assure their customers that, you know, hey, you're just renting the machine. Uh, this is an honest transaction. And they're always limited by that. And if you think about it, what does this do? If you once get a company that has a lot of internal capital, a big company that's rich already, it can play that game much better than all the little companies that are always hand to mouth and just on the edge of existence. So this is a rich get richer dynamic. You see the, the, the birth of IBM at the back of this, that somebody who has a lot of internal capital can afford to do this stuff that's needed to assure customers. It's a structural thing in this market that leads to winner take all kinds of solutions. And you begin to see this whole dynamic of the new economy a hundred years ago that, you know, this is an industry that tends to tip to a few big winners. There are other reasons that's so we'll pick them up, but that's one of the history lessons <coughs> for tonight. And finally, Hollerith is very, very good, as all these new companies are, at finding and meeting the needs of his users. And unlike everybody who came before in this simpler world where my father has this miserable tax accounting job and so I'm going to build a hand crank machine for him, Hollerith begins to develop an institutional ability within his company to search out and figure out these uses. It's not now confined in one man's head. The company itself is making a specialty out of digging out those user needs and satisfying them. It's becoming institutional rather than something that's an accident of birth. All right, so 20th century, rest of tonight. Already mentioned the progressive governments <coughs> and how they wanted data and to feed that Hollerith machines end up in business. Uh, but of course, there are lots of other uh, businesses and sort of a snapshot of Hollerith in the early parts before the First World War. Uh, customers included all the usual suspects. Who are the people who are doing things on a vast scale where you can't just kind of look with your eye and run the business? Factories, steel mills, insurance companies, electric light, traction, those are the streetcar lines, phone, wholesalers, textile mills, auto companies, railroads, municipalities, and state governments. Government is getting big too. Right? In the 18th century there was a joke that you know the British government was conducted after dinner over drinks. That's not the 20th century. You have a huge establishment passing data back and forth uh, to, to exert control over a very complicated society. And that's a natural market for somebody like Hollerith. Uh, what are they used for? Well, they are these sort of standard reports that everybody generated. You want to know your labor costs. You want to know how efficient people are, how efficient divisions are, sales distribution, internal requisitions for supplies and materials, production statistics, Fire, fire life and casualty risk, plant expenditures. You can read the list yourself. It's all the stuff that's sort of the guys in the gray flannel suit in these uh, mid-century plays about the despair of living in modern industrial life. Right? These are the reports they're forever cranking out. The Willie Lomans of the world are all being chased by these punch cards. And what's interesting is all of this stuff, almost all of this stuff, there aren't sort of special requests. Um, I don't wake up in the morning and go, gee, I wonder what the um, efficiency is of the South Division this morning. I'll just call up and have them run a bunch of Hollerith cards. What they do is there are standard reports which are generated each and every week, and you figure out what they are, and you do them every week, and then you do them again, over and over and over again. There isn't this sort of flexibility that we pride ourselves on in the new economy. You have one giant machine with these cards coming out and a standard report being printed out at the end of the process and sent up to management, and then you do it again a week later. Batch processing in the, genre, in, in the jargon. What's that about? Well, the machine is very, very expensive. And from the days of the Census Bureau forward, you wanted to make sure that thing was clattering day and night. You didn't want it to be idle for a moment. So one part of the story is 
that because the machine is very expensive, high V, you want to be sure it's always working, and that means that you have to have a steady line of stuff for it to do. And the other one, of course, is, you know, if the, if you, the machine just does sort of first come, first serve, oh, I came up with my job this morning, you don't know that the most important jobs are the ones that are going to be done. The batch processing <coughs> jobs, the ones that got done every week, represent a judgment that these are the things that are really high value to know about my company. And it's the way things are done in the computer age throughout the first two lectures of this talk, anyway, till 1970. You know, the, the big IBM machines of the 60s are still doing batch process stuff. Standard inquiries coming into the machine every week, standard reports coming out. Comes Monday morning, we do it again. All right, so the Hollerith story goes on. But now, of course, it's very sad if you're pro Hollerith. Uh, the 1900 census is his last big triumph, and then McKinley is assassinated. That probably made Hollerith sad, but what really made him sad was his crony and patron in the uh, Census Bureau, David Porter, was promptly fired as part of the patronage shift that follows McKinley's assassination. And Congress has been grumbling for a long time about the Hollerith monopoly, and what they do is they set up a $40,000 budget to build Hollerith-like machines within the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau is going to build its own machines. Hollerith promptly yanks all his machines so they're not going to be reverse engineered. There's a lot of lobbying back and forth. My influence peddlers are stronger than yours. But at the end, Hollerith doesn't do the 1910 census. Um, the census, in the meanwhile, demands lower prices. And here's a kicker. It gives the patents to its machines, to its employee. It hires somebody named James Powers, who inexplicably is from Odessa, Russia. But, you know, he wanted to assimilate, so he's James Powers. And James Powers builds these new machines, and he gets to keep the patents. What's going on there? Is this just more corruption? I mean, this whole story reeks of corruption. That's a good explanation, but let's see if we can find a better one. So it comes 1911. James Powers has all these wonderful patents for the work that he was paid by the U.S. government to do for the Census Bureau, and he goes out and founds the Powers Tabulating Machine Company, which you know is Remington Rand, right? The people who made Univac in the 50s, and now, I guess, help me with the corporate genealogy, but Unisys would be the descendant. Um, Hollerith, you have these brand new machines that are very technical, technologically adept, the Hollerith company briefly goes to the wall. The, the Powers company is, is actually the market leader for a few years. Uh, and in desperation, because he can't get financing, he merges, and they form something called the Computing Tabulating Recording Company. Uh, he combines his Hollerith machines with other sort of automated things like punch card clocks um, and forms something called CTR, which in 1924 is renamed IBM. So policy. Congress did something really interesting, and we don't credit Congress with being smart, but maybe accidentally they were. Um, there was this question, which I raised for you. Hollerith machines are sold both to the government <coughs> and to the private sector. The government would like to get the benefit of that private sector market, right? Make my, my cost cheaper. Well, what's a better way to do that than to have companies <coughs> bidding against each other <coughs> a government contract? So that's a way to extract the cheapest price from the companies in these markets, if you could set up a market with <coughs> competing companies building these machines and competing with each other, hey, competition is good, particularly after the invention has been made. So let's have them bid against each other for the next Census Bureau contract. That's a way to keep prices down. Now, before the first Hollerith machine, this is so-called ex-ante efficiency, uh, gee, if I'm going to invent this machine and I know that I'm going to be in competition with another company, my profits are going to be low. I might not do it in the first place. But it's a very logical thing for Congress to do after the basic technology is already in place, after the thing has been invented, after we believe that the big ideas are done and we're just doing incremental improvements. By all means, let's set up two companies to bid against each other. So that's what Congress did. And there's a deeper idea behind this, which goes with the slogan that you should know, called Schumpeterian competition. It's a little anachronistic. This is a gloomy <coughs> idea by a gloomy Austrian economist named Joseph Schumpeter about um, in the middle 1930s. And of course, in the middle 1930s, capitalism was going to hell, right? And so what Schumpeter said was, well, it's true. 
that capitalism breeds monopoly and all these industries are monopolized and it's causing the depression and everything is terrible, but there's a bright spot. And the bright spot is that these monopolies only last as long as the next technological revolution. And in the long run, it's re better to have technological progress than to not have monopolies. Because a monopoly takes what you know how to do today and steps on the value to society. It reduces the value of what you know how to do today so that people get less benefit from it. That's why we hate monopoly. That's why we have the Sherman Act. But we can tolerate that if we have a lot of innovation. Because innovation means that next year the product is going to be worth 3% more to me because it's improved. And over the long run, improvements, innovation, are like compound interest. So in the long run, innovation is more important than monopoly, Schumpeter says. And the fact that we're up to our ears in, in, in monopoly is a good thing, um, as long as there's competition at the innovation level. And what Congress has sort of done, none of this has been said in 1910, but what Congress has sort of done is it's set up a competition in innovation between, you know, it's weakened the monopoly, yes, but it's also created the situation where the two companies want to keep their monopoly. They're both <coughs> going to have to innovate like crazy to stay ahead. And that's sort of the story of computing commercially down to the present day, that you have to have, you know, that innovation is the way that people compete much more than price often. Um, all right, so I think that covers that. So now we get on to, tech, to, to the post-World War I computers, the one between the wars. Uh, you probably know that, that uh, digital computers come out of the Second World War, but there was a long and very rich history of complicated machines that were developed between the wars um, that were quite sophisticated. Um, and again, this comes from horrible mathematical problems that the state needs to wage war in other states. Um, and in particular, most of the history of this subject is about firing tables. So if I buy a new artillery piece, I get it manufactured, I still have to know if I put it in, in the ground at such and such an angle and I pull the trigger, where will the shell land? And to do that, I need to, it's a very complicated equation with factors like gravity, ground hardness, the density of the atmosphere changes. The Germans were very surprised. They built this big Bertha gun in the First World War that fired way up in the stratosphere. The shells fell twice as far away as they expected from their firing tables because the air is very thin up there. Um, so a lot of things are important. Coriolis effect, the earth turns under the shell while it's in the air. Um, all sorts of things matter and you end up with an equation that has 15 multiplications that you have to do every tenth of a second to figure out in the next tenth of the second where the, the, the projectile is moved to and which way it's pointed and then you do the whole thing over again and you do 3,000 of those things and you figure out where it falls. Um, and as the shell gets very fast, you get these effects near the sound barrier, so you have to calculate it at one hundredth of a second intervals. Um, and then every four times you do the calculation, you have a check to make sure you did the math right the previous times. And you get so a Steve, I hadn't realized this. These, these are really simulations then, is that right? The calculations? Yeah. They're Newtonian simulations, exactly. Uh, to figure out where the thing will fall. And you have teams of calculators that went up to 100 people, more usually a dozen or so, and they would take five days to do one of these. And by the way, you have 3,000 entries on average that you need for one of these books. And if it's the Second World War and you need to get this gun to the front, you got to finish the book. So it's a real problem tied to national power and to national survival, and it's worth big money, right? This is V with a vengeance. Um, and of course, in the Second World War itself, you get these new problems. The atomic bomb was actually done with old-fashioned Marchand calculators, but by the time you get to hydrogen bombs, um, it's impossible. And in fact, if you look at the history of the debate over whether you can build the hydrogen bomb, you have a long series of arguments between Teller and Oppenheimer, and each one of those arguments ends with a new computer doing an even harder problem to say which one of these guys is right and whether we finally figured out how to build the hydrogen bomb. So computers in the immediate post-war are almost exclusively devoted to these H-bomb problems because there's nothing else in the society that can do these kind of calculations, lots of partial differential equations associated with shock waves. And 
going back to between the wars, um, there are a lot of big science problems, notably including really fancy orbits. If you want to do the orbit of the solar system, um, it's, you know, you can do exactly a two-body problem. You can do special problems exactly which have three bodies orbiting around each other, but they have to be in a very fixed alignment. And beyond that, no one knows how to solve it in general. And again, you're doing what Ed calls a simulation. You're doing one of these time steps where tiny little time steps are calculated, and then you move all the, the objects to their new position as calculated, and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And the solar system, you know, you have to do really, really exact stuff, or you start departing from observations, you know, in a period of hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, so it's an enormous computing problem again, and that was sort of the state-of-the-art problem <coughs> that universities wanted to solve uh, in the uh, 1930s. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, it turns out that the technology of the 30s was this sort of odd Rube, Rube Goldberg sort of system uh, called analog computers. And what you did was you got a glass disk. This red thing here is my idea of a glass disk. And you had a slot in it. And you had a little disk, this green thing riding on top, um, that moved along that slot on the carrier disk. And then tied to that place off center on that disk, you had a big <coughs> long lever that went to this other disk. I told you this was Rube Goldberg. Um, and it turned out that if you rotated the big wheel by some small interval, it rotated this small wheel over here by some interval and depending on how you set up this thing, you could simulate um, a differential equation. That this thing would do the integral of some function that's determined by where this disk is along the slot, um, this green disk here. Uh, that you could, by moving that back and forth, you could simulate a function and figure out the integral. And this was first suggested by James Clerk Maxwell, the guy who invented electrodynamics and was adopted in a big way by Lord Kelvin who wanted to calculate the tides, but he had a problem. He needed to do second order equations, so what he did was he coupled two of these things together, and there's a problem with that because you have these two big long levers, and the, the problem with that is that if you're trying to drive this wheel and have something happen way over here, you're on the short end of a really, really long lever, and it's hard to make this thing work in any smooth way, right? You need enormous force at this end to make this move at all at the, at the output end. So that was a problem. It turned out that for the special thing that Kelvin did, he actually could calculate tide tables uh, using a, a system like this. But, and, and that was a big improvement because in the 1880s, there had only been like three cities in the world that had tide tables because it was so difficult to work them out by hand. And after Kelvin came along, there were these machines that could do the tides for any place on the planet, and all the cities had them. And in fact, these machines were working into the 1950s. But it wasn't general because you had this problem that to do this equation, you needed, you were at the wrong end of the, of the lever, and you had to ha apply enormous force, and that was very inaccurate. So comes the 20th century, and you have lots more differential equations, mostly connected with the electrical grids. We built the things before we really understood them. And an electrical engineer at MIT called Vannevar Bush, I hate saying it that way, but it's the correct way, Vannevar Bush um, had this problem. And he wanted to figure out how to do these differential equations. And the first thing that he did was that he used electricity meters, right? That I'm going to represent the, the, the size of the function as a voltage. And I'll just add up that voltage on one of those spinning meters like the one outside your house. And the problem was that that's fine for sort of the first differential. But now you'd like to take that, that electrical output and drive two of those things in order. And it turned out that there was no way to get um, that voltage to, to, to add voltages from successive meters like that to get this number that he wanted. You could do it after the 1950s. Every double E in the room knows that there's a thing called a, an op-amp circuit. Uh, and, and you can do that. But they didn't know about that. And so Bush was pushed into this world of going back to mechanical amplification, going back to this world that Kelvin had done. And I'm not going to do anything except say that if you stare at this, um, <laughs> this contraption was invented at US Steel. It is a mechanical force amplifier.
and it's power driven and it looks a little bit like a marine capstan those things that you turn to those things that you turn to uh, to, to get purchase on bringing up an anchor or something um, and this thing eventually with lots of love and care from, from Bush managed to do reliable power amplification of a factor of 10,000 so now he could do these second these second order differential equations that he was trying to do and he had lots of motors at each place where these things were connected to give him a power boost so that uh, he could overcome this leverage problem that had stalled the technology. Okay, so what do you do when you do this thing? Well he builds his machine and he has 18 of these integrators each of them with its own motor and wiring and everything else and the thing weighs 100 tons and it has I'm not sure this one had vacuum tubes, but it has 200 miles of wiring and 150 motors. And these are enormously complicated things, but they can, in fact, calculate. Um, and they took an enormous amount of time to set up. You would spend weeks figuring out where all the wheels should be in the slots for this particular problem. And then you would run the thing in, you know, in a matter of hours, and then you would have your answer. But it was an enormous task to set these things up and you set it up for each problem. There was no idea of a program to speak of. And that's so successful that Rockefeller gives him money to make a more advanced one. And by that time he has a bright uh, graduate student named Claude Shannon who later goes on to invent information theory. And Shannon helpfully points out to him that you can do some of the things that don't involve partial differential equations, i.e. Um, adding numbers because the machine had to do that too in a way that uses vacuum tubes. So they begin to take some of these um, tasks and move them out of the, uh, the electrical world or the so-called electromechanical world, electrically driven machinery doing calculation into something that's purely electronic. And the thing also has some paper tape instructions so that you can just have it assemble itself for the problem rather than uh, go in by hand and turn a lot of switches and adjust all these wheels so it's exactly right. And one thing that's very interesting is all this is being built in universities with grant money. And what was called in the 30s cyclotron culture, a, a, uh, a cyclotron is a particle physics machine. And universities were building these like crazy in the 1930s. Berkeley was the core of cyclotrons. And what you would do is you would send your graduate student to any university that wanted one and he would live there <coughs> for a couple of years and show them how to make it too. There was this enormous culture of sharing and these big uh, computers, differential analyzers between the wars were propagated the same way between universities with lots of sharing. Um, very successful kind of cultural model for spreading the knowledge of how to do these things. And it was all done with grants. And why not? There were really only going to be, you know, each country probably wanted firing tables and there might be one other use for it. Uh, this, these were very much one-of-a-kind machines. No one in their right mind would build a second one. Um, and, and therefore, in that world, just pay them to build it. They say they need it. We'll pay them to build it and see if they can solve the problem. It's just like hiring somebody to work on my house. Um, there's really no reason to have him have a patent on the fence he puts up in my front yard. It's an intelligible transaction. You go out and do the work, come up with the result you promised, I'll pay you the money. Uh, and of course, a grant funding situation also gives you the money up front, so there's no problem about, well, gee, how will I get financing to build this thing? All right, so that brings us to probably the last topic for tonight, which is remember when we left this story, um, Hollerith had just sold out his company into a merger to make the Hollerith company into something called CTR, and now we come back to uh, the entity that follows from that IBM. So the first event in this story that you want to know is there's a guy named Thomas J. Watson Sr. who becomes the CEO of CTR in 1914. He had been a national cash register uh, and he was sort of the epitome of the modern marketing guy. He was not an engineer, uh, but he was very good at doing things like advertising, tech support, making sure that the company could give lots of credit to customers who couldn't afford to buy the thing immediately. Uh, and running in-house R&D programs. And these turn out to be exactly the kinds of skills that you need at IBM. Uh, and in particular, of course, uh, this institutionalization of a company whose research product is largely about finding out what its customers actually need and how to fill that need. He's the ideal sort of modern corporate guy in that era to come in and do those functions, but he's not an engineer. <coughs> 
So as you remember, Congress had set up this sort of cage fight where uh, IBM and Remington Rand were both vying for control of this industry. Uh, within a few years, it's clear that IBM has most of the patents. And the first thing that Watson does is he charges enormous <coughs> royalties. He charges 25% of royalties to Remington Rand. And basically, in the recession of 1921, they flirt with bankruptcy. They flirt with going out of business entirely. And Watson relents because he feels the hot breath of the antitrust division of the Justice Department on his back and lowers the, the, the patents to, a, you know, to a, a sustainable level for them. I want to point out there's this odd idea of a reasonable patent price, and there may be such a thing, but if you do a formal model of this, um, you know, Watson can do two things with patents. He can push Remington Rand to the wall. That's basically the same thing as saying you can't use my, my technology at all. Uh, that's one way to use the patent to get rid of competition. Justice doesn't like that. But the other thing you can do is, look, if a big input of your product is a royalty to me, I can tweak that royalty up and down so that the price for these machines in the industry, your price, I control your price now, right? Your price and mine are the same price that a monopolist would set if there were only one monopolist serving the industry. So IBM has, because of its patent position, the ability to set prices on all the machines, not just its own. And that presumably means that at any given point in time, there's sort of a monopoly price for these machines. That's a bad thing, right? We call that ex post inefficiency. But on the other hand, it turns out, this is a kind of punchline, to be supporting wild productivity in terms of innovation, ex ante efficiency, inventing the next thing. Right, and you feed into this Schumpeter idea that, gee, yeah, IBM is sort of a monopoly at any given point in time, but both these guys are inventing like crazy, and in the long run, what would you rather have? Low prices on a crummy technology or high prices, but the technology keeps getting better and better year after year, and compound interest is really powerful. Um, IBM goes through the 20s. Uh, amassing its patent portfolio. Actually, about half the patents in IBM's portfolio in those years aren't IBM patents at all. It just goes and buys them up. And why not? It's the dominant firm in the industry. It has most of the percentage of sales. It has all these revenues. That's one thing you can do when you, when you have this entrenched position. But notice this is another mechanism that the rich get richer in this market. If I can afford to buy up the patents, I become progressively more entrenched and my market share stays high. Do you, do you know to what extent were they utilizing those patents? To what extent were they blocking others from utilizing them? See, this is, the, this is before the new IBM where they cross-license everybody. That's basically because the Justice Department chases them on this issue. Uh, but it, they, they try to set up basically a world in which they and Remington Rand have a cozy little shared monopoly. Um, and what they do in the 30s is getting a little bit ahead of the story, but they try and set things up so that you're not, so that you have to, you're not allowed to sell machines. They use the patents to say no one who uses our patents can not sell, can sell machines outright. They have to lease them. And the Justice Department interprets that rightly or wrongly as a plot to, to say that, well, the cheap way for a new entrant to come into the market and compete with the incumbents, IBM and Remington Rand, the cheap way to do that would be to come in and sell the machines outright. And IBM and Remington Rand are trying to suppress that. And the vehicle they chose to use for that was the patent. So the patent provisions they write do have um, some quality that way. But after the 1921 recession, um, Watson decides that he's never going to use the patents to just drive somebody out of the business entirely, which would be sort of functionally what you're talking about. There's a story that Watson had been uh, indicted and actually sentenced to go to jail for a year on Sherman Act violations when he was at National Cash Register. And people say, aha, you see, after that, he was always a little timid about the Justice Department. That's a real hard story for me to buy with IBM. I mean, he was crazy like a fox, but he wasn't timid. Um, so I don't know that he learned any particular lessons there, but there is sort of this famous story that he wouldn't go too far in pushing the antitrust laws, and he got out of the business of just trying to suppress competition outright. He, he went into this world where you can have the, the thing at a reasonable price, but I'm going to use the royalty to, to make sure you don't sell these too low. I think that's basically the take on it. Got it. Thanks. Does that work for you? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
1924, CTR becomes IBM. And an interesting thing happens in 28, which will be familiar to all everyone who's had anything to do with the new economy. Uh, IBM is upgrading its machines. It wants to start doing things like have cards that uh, print out, that encode alphabetical characters as well as numbers. So it changes the card format. And um, Remington Rand doesn't follow. They come out with their own card format. So they intentionally go to cards that don't interoperate. And that's really interesting because you would think that this is an advantage for IBM, right? That IBM now knows that if I can sell, what happened is that all these card machines that did various things like add and count and sort were all separate machines and they would all sit together in a room and some operator would carry the output from one machine to the next one to do these functions in order. Uh, and what this tells you is, look, if, I, if IBM has an advantage in selling one of those machines, I already own an IBM machine, I've got to buy all my other machines from IBM. And you would think that sort of a second place incumbent like Remington Rand would want to have the IBM standard to try and get its foot in the door and, and sell that. My theory is that Remington Rand was pretty traumatized at that point. And as long as its machines weren't compatible with IBM, things couldn't get any worse, right? It would help them hold on to their own customers. But it's a little bit of an anomaly why they made that business judgment that they wanted to be incompatible with IBM. That works sometimes. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I would just like to know, this is a place where I just w I looked and I couldn't find a historical um, reason. I think because history is written by the winners, so there's plenty of knowledge about why IBM did things. But the interesting question here is what Remington Rand thought it was doing. Um, okay, so Congress still looks pretty smart with this decision to set up two rival companies. Um, IBM works like blazes. So does uh, uh, the Powers Company to, to uh, come up with innovation year after year after year. This becomes a very sophisticated uh, set of technologies. Uh, and in particular, IBM with its big market share, its big budget ability to mobilize resources for R&D does something really interesting. It sets up parallel teams within the company to work on basically the same invention and, and they tell the various teams not to talk to each other. So you set up sort of companies within IBM to compete with each other on innovation and then you take the winning product. Um, this obviously, you know, could have happened with external companies and then they would have bid against each other but because IBM owns all these little groups then it can continue to charge a monopoly price for this stuff. It's really interesting but it shows also you know normally a company you would expect would have sort of one R&D program. Um, it says something about the level of competition for in at the innovation level. It's a Schumpeterian competition for innovation rather than getting the best price on the market today. Um, it says something for that level of competition that IBM had multiple teams. They were obviously innovating frantically in this market. So in that sense, Congress did a good thing in having Remington Rand breathing down IBM's neck. Um, Remington Rand clearly, after the 1920s, didn't do anything to affect the, the price that IBM charged. It was basically a monopoly price. But to keep its position, IBM couldn't be fat and lazy about this. They actually had to keep innovating like crazy and in that sense Congress did very well. Um, so what are the things that happen? Well you get a, a tabulator that does subtraction. Subtraction is hard. Uh, you get a multiplying punch. It takes a card with two numbers, multiplies them and punches the answer in 1931. Um, you get something that prints numeric figures and then you get something that prints alphabetical output so you can actually read the customer's name next to the totals. And these are really interesting machines. They're incredibly complicated. So IBM builds this classic machine, which is still being produced in the 1960s at 1,500 a year, uh, called the Type 405. It has 55,000 moving parts, 75 miles of wiring, and you know, electronic computers only become the biggest part of IBM's business in 1962, right? This is an incredibly powerful, versatile technology. And notice that a company that can build complex objects like this, particularly when it can build complex objects that involve vacuum tubes, which is not far away in this story, has a huge ability to compete in the computer market, whether or not it builds computers at that point in time. Because the ability to manufacture these things is really about having 75 miles of wiring and everything's wired to the correct place. No errors, right? 
And it's an extraordinary human artifact. To build a team that can do that is sort of a new kind of human activity, to build perfect objects like this. This is sort of a hallmark of the way the 20th century did research. This is how our objects are different from the innovations of the 19th century, that you build something that is so complicated that has 75 miles of wiring and it's all perfect. The only thing I know like that is an integrated circuit today, right, where you put it up on the wall and there may be little pieces that they never got to work, but the rest of it is this tapestry and everything is wired correctly. If it wasn't, it wouldn't work. I mean, it's an extraordinary human achievement to make something like that. But an integrated circuit, you only make once, and then you litho it off. These IBM machines, they made year after year after year. So when the Air Force in the 1950s, getting ahead of the story, decides it wants to build the most complicated computer that's ever been built, who does it go to? The guys who were the leaders in the computer company and made 20 research computers, none of which had, had you know, been produced in a mass manufactured way or IBM, which had 3.5 million vacuum tubes out in the field, right? They went to IBM, and they pretty much had to, right? Because no one could manufacture this object, whether they were a computer company or not, IBM had this enormous advantage. So it's a very powerful technology, and it turns out it, it, it leads over into computers quite readily. So this R&D competition continues, right? And you can begin to see the birth of computing. And all of you know from high school, Newton's law, F equals MA. So if you want to have something accelerated and you have apply a force to it, if that thing is very light, you get a lot of acceleration for a given force. If it's heavy, uh, uh, you know, it takes a long time to accelerate it. Um, and if you have something as heavy, and obviously it is heavy, as a paper card, and you're moving it from place to place, you know, you can only do that so fast. And if you can, instead of that, move electrons around, you can get them up to the third of the speed of light without breaking a sweat, right? So electronics has this huge speed advantage over anything that involves mechanical parts or moving cards or even the switches the telephone company used to use that, you know, would have a little, two little metal jaws inside a um, uh, coil. And when the coil was energized with electricity, the two jaws would become magnetized and click together. If you've ever been next to one of those green boxes on the sidewalk, that's that clicking going on. It's making telephone connections with these little moving jaws back and forth. But those little jaws, they don't look like much, but they're massive on a molecular scale. And those are slow. They only close in one thousandth of a second. If you have a vacuum tube, you're moving electrons back and forth, and you're really moving fast. So everybody knew this. And it was obvious from the beginning. I don't think you have this idea that, gosh, somebody woke up and had this brilliant idea about vacuum tubes. It was immediately obvious that electronics was going to be a lot faster. And if you could start swapping out things that were done mechanically in the 1930s with things that could be done electronically instead, you were going to get very fast machines. And so IBM, because it has this big budget and because it feels the powers company breathing down its neck, starts investing in magnetic cards. It starts investing in a technology called magnetic drums where you store data as a pattern of magnetism on a rotating drum. The two-dimensional version of a drum is a disk. They have the disk idea. They don't know quite how to make it in the 30s, but they know that this is the way it's going to go. Um, and they start replacing wheels with vacuum tubes. And they start figuring out electronic logic, which I don't think we'll get to tonight, but they start figuring out ways to do circuits that don't involve a wheel clicking from one position to the next the way Pascal taught us to. Uh, and all this stuff is in place before the war. They're not making computers, but they're making stuff that is the electronic circuitry that will eventually be in computers. Um, and they're doing it in the context of improving these punch card machines, but does it really matter in the long run because the experience is converging, the technologies are converging. And the thing that they do very well, of course, is what they have always done, is find out customer needs. That's a form of innovation. And in the Depression, they have this problem, right? They're afraid all these leased machines will come back. And so what they do is they set up a methods research department. Let's go out to our customers and find new ways that they can get value from our machines. And IBM is sort of this hero of the depression that they don't cut back on production. They keep making these machines even though the shareholders are scared to death, right? Nobody's buying new machines, but at least the least ones aren't coming back. Um, and IBM manages to, to continue its business 
by finding new value for users and deepening this organizational ability to go find ways that the customer can benefit from our machines. And of course, big government bails them out. Social Security is billed as the world's biggest bookkeeping job in 1936, and the government starts buying IBM machinery like crazy. Um, and you have more big government, employer reporting, public works projects. You need some control over the data that the government demands that these big projects generate, and, one, and that's more V, more value for using computing equipment in general and IBM machines in particular. So IBM after 36 actually basically almost doubles its revenues. Uh, the depression isn't so bad for them after 36 because the, you know, they managed to hold on by persuading their customers that they can find new value and once the new deal gets rolling, um, big government is all about new uses for IBM equipment, at least the way IBM sees it. Okay. So, um, what about this industry? So we've already talked about this point, um, but notice that there is not one but several stories, lots of good stories about why you expect this to be a very strange market, a market where there will be a winner-take-all dynamic, where you know there will be someone who is the biggest company and then there will be a lot of other companies. I mentioned one of them, which is this problem that these companies find it very hard to get capital on ordinary capital markets. So if you already have a lot of money, you can do things like lease machines, and that's what customers want because they have this information problem. Um, and that's a big advantage. So the people who already have a lot of money make more sales. There is a second reason which is reputation. People look at this and say, you know, that's naive. IBM says that they have this, uh, you know, reputation. I should trust them. And therefore, the fact that they know about these machines and I don't, I'll trust them. I mean, this is for children. But it's actually a little bit more subtle than that. Uh, IBM knows that its reputation does boost sales. And the customers know that <coughs> IBM's reputation is valuable to IBM and it's hostage to failure. So IBM wants to keep this asset, this reputation, and that means if they come to my plant and install this thing and it doesn't work, they'll work like crazy to make sure that it does work because they and I both know that their reputation is valuable. It's a little circular, but the fact is IBM knows that its reputation is a huge advantage in this industry, and that's a commitment to customers that it will preserve its reputation. It can't afford not to have, to, to have failures to impair this asset. Um, it could be. The R&D for the, these are such complicated objects, and there are so few of them, right? The installed base of all the punch card machines in the country is about 10,000 in these years, right? Um, it could be that there really isn't room for more than one or two R&D programs in this industry, right? Um, it's not a huge industry by American standards. IBM's actually a fairly small company compared to RCA or the giants of the 1930s. Uh, it's a big fish in a relatively small pond. It may be there's just not room for a couple of IBMs. Once you have one doing this at a big level, uh, a second guy could come in, but neither of them would make a living at that point. That may be another reason why this market tended to have one big competitor. There just isn't room for five competitors, each with their own big R&D program. Patents we've mentioned. There are these accidents of the business cycle. Remington Rand really never recovered from the uh, sharp, short depression of 1921. Um, those kinds of historic accidents get locked in. Uh, IBM had a good depression compared to other American companies. That extended its lead over Remington Rand. They had about 85% of the market for these machines at the end. And in a world where you, know, you tend to have advantages from being big, uh, these historical accidents are locked in forever. So that's a reason that you would expect some tipping in this market. There is this point about customer lock-in. IBM Customers use IBM cards. They can't easily go out and change their whole card base, right? People kept libraries of these cards. They don't want to repunch all those, recode all those for some incompatible Remington Rand thing, particularly if they're not going to replace all their IBM machines. If you're going to buy one new machine, it's going to be IBM because we've got to use the cards on it. This is customer lock-in. It's a salient feature of the new economy. I want to point out we didn't invent it, right? This is going back to the 1930s. And finally, I want to show you something kind of pretty just because I can do a cartoon of it. But it turns out that a big company in one of these markets, in a market that's driven by R&D, a big company gets more benefit than a small company does. So I just want to show you that as a cartoon. So this is what a monopolist 
earns in a market like this. And you all, most of you have seen this before, but this is a demand curve. And what, in a competitive market, the price would be down here, but of course IBM can charge more or less what it wants, and the point, it, the, what it picks is the quantity price time, I'm sorry, the, it wants to pick uh, price times quantity, price times quantity has dimensions of profit, revenue, right? And so it wants to maximize this space of price times quantity, and it will pick a price that does that. So that's what a monopolist does. But now I want to show you the part that's the, the interesting aspect for tonight. Suppose it improves one of its products. So that's the same thing as customers now get more value for it, and this demand curve moves out, right? That's what it means when customers get more value for a particular thing. And let's say that IBM takes its profit by raising its price. Customer is indifferent, right? It has a better machine and it charges a slight, it's charged a slightly higher price. That's a wash for the customer. The customer is happy with that, or at least not unhappy. He's indifferent. And, and so the IBM raises the price. Now, what's the new profit? It's this pink area. I guess I'm doing this inconsistently. Uh, you go up, the price rise is W. And the profit to IBM, this is the punchline, depends on the product W times L. So if IBM starts out with a big L, it's selling a lot of these machines already, then on each of those machines it makes a profit W. So a firm that has a big share of the market already gets more return from, from R&D improvements than a firm that doesn't. And so that's another reason that you know the rich get richer in these markets. But the point impressionistically is this is kind of a peculiar market really for American capitalism, but because of the emphasis on R&D, because of the emphasis on standards, because of the emphasis on patents, you have this tipping dynamic in which you suspect that someone, maybe IBM, but someone is going to end up dominant always and that you're in this world of Schumpeterian competition. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Help, this is that again. Help me translate this into rationale for investments in research that looks out five or ten years as opposed to R&D, which is mostly the next product generation. So the, the stimulus is yesterday was actually the 15th anniversary of Microsoft research, which causes, which is the part of Microsoft that looks out more than a product generation, okay? And that leads folks in the press to ask the question, why is it that only big companies do that? And of course, not all big companies do, but if you look at IT these days, Cisco, Oracle, Dell, they're doing nothing that looks more than one product cycle out. But if you look historically, IBM, Xerox, AT&T, Microsoft have made those investments. Does, right. does this little cartoon you drew say anything about investments in research that looks further out, or is it only shorter term product cycle innovation? The cartoon doesn't, but you know what this goes back to is the original Schumpeter assertion, right? So the, we don't know whether he's right, but it's very provocative. And what he said was, look, in, in this wonderful Adam Smith market that you guys claim you like, let me go back and show you this. Um, in this wonderful Adam Smith market that you guys claim you like, Competition drives the price down to cost. I'm getting cost. I'm, I'm getting. Mar I can only sell products out the door at the cost of producing the next one. Marginal cost, right? The market is pushing me to this place where I'm always hand to mouth, where I'm just working on the on on you know today's product today. Uh, and it's only a monopolist, right? I mean, this sounds like an evil argument, right? I resist it with every fiber of my being. But it's only a monopolist who can actually ignore day-to-day -day pressures and do innovation, who can come up with that surplus over just what it's, you know, I can only earn what the cost of producing the thing is. That's what classical economics boasts about. The competitive markets drive everybody down to just the cost of production, no profit. And yet it's the profit that the R&D comes out of. And if you look at things classically like Bell Labs, right, um, look, Bell Labs, Bell Labs was part of Bell, and Bell was the closest thing to the government that one could imagine, right? They had, 
They were completely insulated from market pressure. And IBM has that quality in both the Second World War and Korea. Uh, the first thing they do is they show up to the government and salute and say, what would you like us to build? Um, a company that is really part of a competitive market cannot do that. Uh, it's only because they're insulated from the market they can do that. Now the deeper question and the scary question is, fine, so they're insulated from the government, why do I believe that they're going to then look 10 and 15 and 20 years out? Because they're good people, I find that unsatisfying, right? Um, and then you need some theory about, you know, about their corporate vision and I think the best you can do in sort of a cold-blooded economist way is you can say Bell was always embarrassed about their monopoly. They, they and IBM both knew that if they just spent the money on wild parties, right, um, uh, Justice Department would break them up. Monopolists are forever trying to show that they're good people. Um, but they wouldn't have to show it in terms of this long-term future, you know, 15 and 20 years out. It's an unsatisfying story, basically. The most that you can say for the Schumpeter position is, you know, if they really only get the market return from a competitive market, they don't have anything to play with. They have no money for the future um, monopoly, I mean, for the future product. Um, and that's obviously what the patent system is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to make sure that, that if they do the R&D, they will get more than the market gives them. A patent is a legal monopoly. It's intentionally short-circuiting this thing that we normally love in microeconomics of a competitive market. A patent is designed to keep that from happening. And if you're IBM and you have a really big surplus to play with, um, it makes what you're talking about possible. It's a little shaky to say that it makes it inevitable. Any Great. thoughts, Ed? Yeah, thanks. Um, and finally, just because I was raised on this puzzle, I think a lot of us were, people who remember IBM in the 60s, um, all the machines were leased and they had this, this business about, you know, they would sell you the cards. And actually for a long time, IBM had this magic card stock that nobody knew else knew how to make. So even if you bought a black market card, it would foul on the machines. <laughs> um, but in any case, what's that about? Well, we've given one story for leasing which is that it's about uh, the customer doesn't trust the vendor. There is a whole economics of contracts that are imperfect, and this is sort of a classic example. Leasing certainly fulfills that. The legend that IBM told about itself was that this was the foresight of Thomas Watson, who knew that when the Depression came along, they'd have this nice, smooth leasing income, and they wouldn't have a big, you know, their sales wouldn't fall off a cliff, that it cushioned the, the business cycle. Maybe that's true. He certainly said that after the 1921 recession. It's not where it came from to begin with. And there's the Justice Department theory that you need a lot of money to run a leasing empire as opposed to selling the stuff and pocketing the money in you know, six months or something, uh, and that this is a barrier to entry. And indeed, uh, IBM and, um, Sperry and, and, and Remington Rand did a deal with each other that said that it's immoral to sell business machines. You have to lease them and sell cards. And why would they do that if they didn't think they were preserving their market from entrance coming in from the outside? Um, there's a more interesting question about why they sold the cards. And it turns out that there's um, the proofs that monopolies are inefficient actually don't hold if I can charge each customer a different price. Um, in that case, they're efficient in the economist's term, although the monopolist gets a lot of money and the customers get nothing. But nevertheless, um, you can get around sort of the worst features of monopolies if you can charge each customer a separate price. And if you sold the cards to people as opposed to the business machines, the heavy, machi the heavy users of computing self-select. They need a lot of cards, right? And so if you put the price on the cards, you can actually charge a different price to each customer. So there's a sense in which that was a really elegant way of what the economists call price discrimination, which the economists always make everything sound bad, but actually from a welfare standpoint, price discrimination is something you want to encourage. Um, cards, of course, also were this stream of income in the Depression, and we've talked about cards as standards. Um, in 1936, the Justice Department pushes on IBM, and there's a settlement, and they agree to open up um, they agree that they will sell 
uh, their machines if you want them to, and they claim it's at a price that won't discourage you from leasing, although most people continue to lease. You would kind of expect that if you believe my information asymmetry argument. Uh, hey, Steve? They, yeah. Do, do you know in the 30s, what was IBM's uh, annual card sales revenue versus their lease revenue, machine lease revenue? It was something like 20 percent. I'm sorry, it was something like 10 percent, but 20 percent of the profits, some disproportionate part of the profits of IBM uh, were in the, in, the, in the card sales, which, as I say, is what you would do this for, right? The, the 30s theories about why tying cards to uh, machines is an antitrust violation are pretty poor economics, and, and the modern antitrust authorities, certainly the modern antitrust academics, tend to like this card selling scheme because it means that the users who use stuff intensively actually pay more. And so what IBM did is what a rational firm would do is they used the cards. You would expect the cards to be a profit center because that's where the high users of cards are spending the money. The machines themselves um, weren't a big profit center for IBM over their normal sales, but the cards were where the profits were concentrated. Steve, I was it was on the order of 20 or 30 percent of the profits. Steve, another question about information yeah. asymmetry. So how does the information asymmetry argument uh, interact with the reputation? Because it seems after a while you establish reputation, customers are going to believe that you're going to deliver. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, the, the, the embarrassment in this is, is embarrassment in history in general, right, is you don't have really controlled experiments. And I think all these things are true at some level, but I'd love to have an argument that, that would tell me which of those things is doing most of the work. It's quite clear in the early history of Hollerith, right, where there's no reputation, right. that these deals where I lease it to you and I give it to you free for six months are essential and that you need bi bank financing to make that happen. That's, that's really clear. And in fact, as late as 1914, IBM tries to float some loan on the open market, and they're a big company by then. And there's this legend that, that um, uh, Thomas J. Watson Sr. is such a great salesman that even though they turned us down for the loan, he managed to get them to change their mind, right? That's a company that has real hard trouble getting financing. By the time you get to the 30s, and people are beginning to cheerfully tell each other nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM, uh, I don't know. Um, so I, I, I do think that, you know, that that shifts over time. I, I agree with your instinct that you would think reputation would begin to supplant. Um, I mean, I suppose the point is, it's a, it's a, you know, the whole reputation argument is circular, but what's reputation worth to IBM? At some point you may say it's a big enough mess, maybe they just will dump the whole thing. And actually, the system 360 in the 1960s comes into this period of crisis where IBM is losing money hand over fist and they're having trouble making the operating system work, uh, I got to think a lot of people swallowed hard. And that's the place where, boy, reputation, they, they really invested a lot to make that thing work. Um, that was a bet the company at that point and, and clearly about protecting reputation and the 9,000 orders that were pending for the thing at that point. Okay, thanks. Um, and finally, IBM supports academics and academics' various scientific ambitions. Um, and in particular, it goes to Columbia because that's close to their headquarters. And they say, we have these wonderful punch card machines. What would you like to do with them? The first thing improves the life of everyone in this room. Uh, they invent uh, what we would now call computer-graded tests, right, like the SATs. Um, and they notice as soon as IBM invents a machine that subtracts, that, gee, Babbage had this idea for a difference engine, um, and so they start using uh, difference methods with punch card machines for advanced computing, calculating hard astronomical problems, and um, then they do something which is really Babbage-like, and they invent a so-called calculation control switch in which punch cards going through one machine control the operations of the other machine. So you've got something like a program telling the adder what to do in what order. Um, so you know you have something that's flirting with the idea of a computer, uh, all of this being done for academics at Columbia so they can do their problems and write papers that the rest of us don't care about. Um, that's actually kind of an example of a lead user, right? IBM is very shrewd to go to smart people who have unusual uses. It's a little bit like the people in the 16th century who bought automata. I don't know what this is good for, but you know, building machines for these guys, maybe the future of the world is 
uh, problems like this, which indeed it turns out to be. And finally, um, kind of to close out the night, IBM runs into a professor at Harvard named Howard Aiken. He's a physicist, and he wants to build a big machine with electromechanical parts, right? Electric motors and, and pulleys and wheels and, and lots and lots of wiring to do calculations. And he's walking around trying to get sponsors and finally word gets back to the physics department. It gets back to a technician who runs the experiments for the physics department, right? The, the professors don't do that stuff. And the guy says to him, why are you trying to do this? We've got one of those machines in the attic and nobody uses it. And it turns out, by God, that when Babbage had cut up his, uh, his pieces of the difference engine, uh, he had given them out as souvenirs, little pieces about a foot square on, on uh, pedestals, and Harvard had gotten one for its bicentennial, and this thing really was sitting up in the attic. It wasn't functional, but Aiken hears about Babbage, and he runs down the library and says, it's almost like the man is speaking to me. It's, it's uncanny. Uh, it is not, however, that he read it closely enough to figure out the business about if statements and branching logic because the machine he built didn't do that. But he did go to IBM and say, you know, this is a lot of moving parts and wheels. It's something you're really good at. Maybe it's pushing your technology in a good direction. IBM writes him a check first for $20,000, but in the best Babbage tradition, that's not enough money. Then $100,000. And then finally, I think the final price is $200,000 when this thing finally emerges in 1944. Um, and it does exactly what Babbage wants. It's got cards going through it to control all the processes. The thing is about 50 feet by 5 feet deep or 10 feet deep. Um, and it's got um, lots and lots of counting wheels inside, all of them driven by motors. Um, And it works, and it does something like three, three addition operations a second, which is slow even by 1930s standards. But it does have this programmable character. Unfortunately, it doesn't have if statements. Um, and the problem with it is that it pushes the technology about as far as this technology is ever going to go. Uh, in order to get stuff accurate to one part in 10,000, you need to machine the wheels because they interact with each other and errors accumulate to a part in 100,000. It turns out in the 1930s you can actually do better than that, but even though this thing is sitting in a basement so that it doesn't get shaken a lot and it's in an air-conditioned room so there's no dust, if you run the thing for about a week, it goes out of alignment again. So it doesn't matter how much in theory you can machine these wheels to. This is about the ultimate machine that you can build and have the thing works. Um, I see, you know, this is the problem with dead machines. There are very few people alive who ever saw this work. Uh, so you see things in the literature that uh, it sounded, this is a power driven machine. I think it has a five horsepower electric motor running it. You see things in the literature about how this thing sounded like a textile mill. I prefer the more polite uh, memoir that said that it was like a room full of women knitting. I don't know why I like that, but it seems musical. <laughs> so what do we make of this? Uh, well, I've told you the most optimistic story I know how to tell you, that this is Schumpeterian competition. The problem with that is Schumpeterian competition in this world is sort of a happy accident. For 30 years, the powers company has managed to just hang on by its fingernails to keep IBM hearing footsteps, and that's really happy. But how do we know that that will happen for another 30 years? What happens when they go extinct or become so small as to be completely irrelevant? Um, it's a nice accident. I don't know what it means. And academic exploration has worked rather nicely. And if you look at it in a cold-blooded way, this is a little bit like what Ed said, right? This is an example of IBM using its monopoly profits to do something that no company in a competitive market could do, which is subsidize random academics who are doing interesting, cool stuff, which might have applications 30 years from now. Uh, and again, you sort of have this theory that maybe Aiken is a lead user, although he turns out not to be the, the Harvard Mark I as a dead end. Um, so where are we? As you roll into 1940, we're on the verge of building real computers. What would somebody have said? In hindsight is 2020, of course. But we started off already in ancient times. You had basically four markets for computing, governance, military, science, and commerce. In 1940, um, computers, things that are cutting-edge computing devices as opposed to hand calculators and Hollerith machines, 
um, are all about military problems and in particular about ballistics. There are very few other uses for it. Those things are funded in a grant mode by the military. Why not? You're making a one-off machine. What would a patent be good for anyway? Uh, and they also do science. So military and science are in this grant-dominated world. And on the other hand, governance and commerce are being supplied by IBM and this sort of Schumpeterian industry commercial model. So will those things come together? You know, one of the stories of the 50s and 60s is that in the 40s, people still believed there were scientific computers and business computers. And that line becomes progressively blurred until you end up with the system 360 where it disappears for a lot of purposes. Um, so that's, you know, but in 1940, there's this world where you do one set of computing in, in, in one mode rare one-off machines and another set of computing in the other mode. Um, looking at the cost side, costs really haven't fallen a lot, right? Instead of exquisitely machined gears, now you use vacuum tubes. I guess that's a savings, but building the second computer is almost as expensive as the first one. Uh, and as I say, the punchline of this story is going to be when you can do in integrated circuits and print them off like magazine articles, right? The second one is just infinitely cheaper than making the first copy. Uh, but in 1940, that doesn't exist. And it looks like the bigger machine you can make, the more computing you get per dollar. That's actually formalized in the early 50s as something called Grosch's Law. And, you know, people like to laugh at John von Neumann and the NAS panels who said in the 1940s and 50s, the world will only need two or three big computers. But I ask you, if we were building them with 500 miles of wiring inside each of them, we probably would only need a couple of computers. Coming attractions, last slide, I promise. Um, we've basically covered this, but in the value proposition, once you discover that you can make these machines for the government to solve artillery problems, for science to do science problems, it's inevitable to ask whether the new electronic machines can serve a civilian market. This is the same saga of going out and finding new uses, that that's a kind of innovation. And the innovation of the 50s and 60s is largely about trying to figure out how to make these one-off military beasts really commercial so that they can do accounting packages, which isn't romantic, but which is where the great value of the society lies, right? Uh, and as I say, there's this punchline when you get the integrated circuits and software where the, where the ability to copy this stuff basically falls to zero. So moving forward, we expect you know, the IBM world, the Schumpeterian competition, to be continued. Thank you all. Great. Before we break, let me remind people, get on the wiki, get on the course email list, and uh, sign up for UBD Expert. Okay, Steve, thank you. That was fantastic. Really good.